You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important topics of the world of Indiana basketball. Not sure what episode this is. We are just going to talk basketball. Uh, we don't even have a rush winging it, today, coach. A, We're winging it. It's it's yeah, a couple weeks uh, out since uh, Indiana's season has ended, uh, and so we're just uh, we're just going off the cuff today. But we will start uh, with our banner moment, and let's begin with that banner moment. Uh, how we begin every edition of the assembly call, and that is with our Hoosier proud banner moment. This week's banner moment happened uh, Monday night in Assembly Hall when the women's basketball team won their contest against Oklahoma to advance to the Sweet 16 to face undefeated South Carolina and have a huge upset this Friday, 5 o'clock, mark it down. But what a great win. A lot of good things uh, to be banner moment. One, the outstanding play uh, of the ladies. It was a struggle. Oklahoma played outstanding defense. But the women stayed with it, stayed with it, stayed with it. Then Mackenzie Holmes was dominant late and pulled out a victory in the last couple minutes, down four, 64-60. They were able to come back and win. But kudos also to the fans. Uh, when you, when the ladies put out a great product, uh, as they have over the years and over the years, the fans have grown and grown and grown and grown. And, and what a great thing. My, my son was able to go down there. I wasn't able to go down there on Monday night. I watched here at home. But just an incredible atmosphere all year long. So a banner... Uh, shout out to all of the fans who have embraced the women's program. Every year you have consistent play. It doesn't always end up where uh, we want them to with a national championship. Uh, a, a tough loss last year, but just keep rebuilding. And then the third banner moment or shout out with that is to Terry Morin, who has come in here and built a winner, a consistent winner, built a program that a lot of us Uh, Indiana fans and Indiana alums can be extremely, extremely proud of. So this week, a complete banner moment uh, to the women's uh, basketball program. So joining me here today, we're going just straight off the cuff, just getting you some content out here, is my buddy uh, Ryan Phillips. Uh, Multiple hat Ryan Phillips now with a bunch of things that he's doing. Uh, Okay. There's but some legal, just very things busy. legally we can't talk okay. about yet, Coach. So, <laughs> Okay, v- very busy guy in, in yes. writing. We'll just say very busy guy in writing. Uh, but your you thoughts, it's been a, been a couple weeks since the loss in the Big Ten tournament for the Indiana men's program. We, I just mentioned the Indiana's women. What's on your mind about Indiana athletics in general? Uh, you know, the women just continue to shine. And I think that that's been the case for the last few years, uh, especially in comparison to the men's program. And it's not a knock on the men's program. It's just, you see them consistently reload, consistently play really good basketball. Whereas for the past, you know, what decade, the men's program has just been such a roller coaster. And and Terry Morin deserves all the credit in the world for that, for developing that. As for the men's program, uh, obviously clear where, as we expected, off to the NBA, uh, almost certainly. I, you know, and he's declared, but I don't think there's any chance of him coming back, regardless of what happens. Uh, I think you'll see Kenzie and Baco go get some draft evaluation and see what happens there. Uh, but you heard Gabe Cups is coming back. We've got, you know, basically have the roster back that you're expecting, and then the question mark is going to be uh, Mackenzie and Baco essentially moving forward. That's the way you can move forward with this. Uh, but. We'll see. I think it's, I believe it's seven scholarship spots open. Uh, a lot of NIL money has been promised uh, due to certain circumstances behind the scenes. A lot of, a lot of NIL money has been promised to help lure guys. I know a lot of people were uh, all about the, uh, well, you got to skip the NIT and jump in on the portal early because you'll have an advantage. There is no advantage to being in early. These guys are going to teams that are already in the tournament. And I think that the top players are going to take their time and see the top schools anyway. So I don't think there's this mad rush. I've heard people being like, why don't they have anybody yet? And it's because some of these guys are going to see the teams that are still playing uh, 
you know, some teams can handle bringing guys in on weeks there. You know, there's you know five days between games. You can bring a guy to campus in that time or whatever. Uh, some of these guys have been recruited by those teams already and know what the campus is, know what the situation is, and so therefore can just flip and and play for the coaching staff. So, I uh, I think that that this whole mad rush to be first really is kind of overblown, and, and I think that that Indiana fans are going to have to wait it out to find out what the roster looks like next year because a lot of these other schools are going to wait for who declares the NBA, who on their team transfers, and then they're going to you know, dive in on the same players Indiana's diving in. If you look at the lists, Indiana's contacting a lot of people. So it's yeah, I had some people t- ask me just straight up, like, which guys are they going to get? And I'm like, I have no idea. You know, we don't they even got, you know, they got to get guys to campus first before you can even think about anything else. So um, some teams are landing guys early. A lot of these guys will take their time, especially the top tier guys, because they can afford to take their time because schools will wait for them. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how it plans out, plays out. And we're going to talk a lot about that in segment two. Jared will be joining us shortly. Um, he's putting his son to bed right now, and he plans to be here. And we're just going to talk um, as much as we know about Porto. We really don't know a, a whole lot other than what you see on social media about who's being contacted. We know there's a couple visits coming in, but we're definitely going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk uh, uh, about – the NCAA tournament and some general thoughts about the NCAA tournament. Uh, all of that will uh, be coming up uh, in segment two. And then I'm not sure we have any questions, but if we do, uh, we'll try to answer them again as we usually do in segment three. Uh, but now let's talk about our presenting sponsor. This edition of Assembly Call Radio, just like all shows on the Back Home Network, is presented by our friends at Home Field Apparel, where they have the largest collection of vintage IU apparel that you'll find anywhere. Uh, and, and just a, a, a quick plug, I was able to be on a, a call uh, with Connor and a few other uh, customers uh, today where they were sharing some of their ideas. And I'm telling you, save your money up, uh, because uh, I, I can't uh, share with you some of the things that they're working on. But they shared some about the process, and they're constantly looking 12 to 18 months ahead with new ideas and when to drop shirts and when to add different things. And we've seen the collection from uh, the Indy 500. uh, That's been a a success for them. But I'm telling you, there are some new uh, products coming out uh, here in the summer and in the fall that I think I'm going to definitely buy. That doesn't surprise anybody. I know that. But... Uh, really interesting to get a little behind the scenes uh, information and they are really working for those of us who really love college apparel so um, no matter what you end up buying you know it's going to be comfortable colors will wash uh, last through many washings and you're supporting the Indiana based company that is just exploding it came up through Kelly what could be better uh, than that so go to homefieldapparel.com use our promo code home23 for 15% off your first entire order that's promo code home Two three for fifteen percent off. Once again, the website is homefieldapparel.com. Wear one for the team. All right, uh, Ryan. Let's just talk a little bit about NCAA basketball. March Madness never seems to to disappoint, and it's been a unique tournament here as we get ready for tomorrow night. The reason we're here on Wednesday is because a lot of people will be watching uh, those games on Thursday night. It's opening day. A lot of, of people, baseball. including us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Um, I think it's been interesting because you had great games and upsets, and now the chalk has kind of made its way to the Sweet 16, which gives us outstanding, uh, if you love college basketball, some outstanding matchups and really uh, some unsure uh, Final Four selections uh, still to be decided. But your thoughts uh, on uh, the opening round of the NCAA tournament? Yeah, what's interesting this year is it's the it's like the third it's it's only the second time since like 1996 all one and two seeds made it to the Sweet 16, and on top of that, 14 out of the 16 teams are Power Six conference teams, and the other two are San Diego State and Gonzaga, who have each been in a national championship game in the last three years. So it's Power Conference basketball. I mean, yeah, San Diego State and Gonzaga aren't in Power conferences; they're essentially Power Six teams. You know, I mean, w- right. without the conference designation. Um, and so it's a it's a power tournament this year, and and we've had ones where you know four, like three twelve seeds or three twelve or below make the Sweet Sixteen. That's not this year. I mean, the the lowest seed to be in is NC State, who won the ACC tournament. You know, I it, like 
and they're an 11 and they were probably the worst team to make it if you look overall, but they also are a team that's very talented. They just kind of caught their stride at the right time. Uh, I, I don't know about you coach is your, my, I wrote the other day that I think right now it's UConn versus the field. I, I think that UConn is so good and I think they've been the best team all year, you know, taking a 300 foot view, not week to week. I think they've been the best team all year. I think it's fascinating how they lost their two best players and might actually be better this year uh, than last year. Maybe not the NBA talent they had last year, but they certainly fit Hurley's system really well. And you've got guys like Klingon who are like getting better as the season goes and has maybe had his two best performances in the tournament. And then you got Spencer, who everybody hates, but is damn good. And Newton, who torched Indiana and, and all these other guys, they just fit really well. It feels like UConn, to me, watching it feels like they are far and away the favorites right now. Is that? And I know they were the number one overall seed, but they actually are playing like it at this point as well. Yeah, they. Um, I, I think they have to have a bad night, and another team has to really be on their game for for them not to win uh, the tournament. But you have teams that can do that. You know, um, you know, I don't think Illinois is good enough to beat UConn except on that one kind of night where they go crazy and score 80, 90 points and just outscore uh, a UConn team. You know, in the tournament, it's all about matchups. It's all about that one moment, right, when, when you get there. We saw you that with Jack Golke. Once. You only got to beat Gokey him once. hits 10 yeah. out of 23. He's one of the greatest performances that I've seen. And I a was at the Horizon player, semifinals. The yeah. <laughs> I was at the Horizon semifinals and saw the dude jack seven of them. Right, so it wasn't a surprise to me, but it was just great. You know, uh, you look at it. There's no way Kentucky loses to Oakland, but it was one of those nights. That kid yeah. was just having one of those nights, which is what the NCAA tournament. You had an Oregon kid, was it Quiznard or whatever, forty, drop 40, yeah. 40 uh, in their upset victory. So the only reason I think you know you until they win it, you really don't know. But of I agree not. with you. I think that's you the, have to call the them the favorite. Yeah, but the tournament. I think there are some people. You got Shannon in in, in that way. Uh, San Diego State has some veteran. I, I don't think they're as good I mean, as last year, but yeah, you get to the final four. Their, they got a chip on their yeah. shoulder for this one from the championship game from last year. I think they'll come out very passionate. San Diego State's problem, and it was the problem in the national championship game last year, and it's been the problem all year, is making shots. If they don't make shots, yeah. they're going to lose by 15-20. If they do make shots, that's an interesting game because of what the, how physical they are and the kind of defense they play. So let's welcome in Jared Morris. Uh, I'm giving up my temper, uh, temporary uh, leadership of the show to you, Jared. You're back in charge. I hope Teddy is fast asleep and doing well. But welcome to the show. All we've done is give our opening remarks. Mine was on women's basketball. So was Ryan's for the most part. Ryan dabbled in a little bit of the portal stuff. And then we just went into the NCAA tournament. So that's, that's where we have been. Your thoughts on the NCAA tournament. Beautiful. And then you can take over and lead us wherever you'd like to lead us. Good to be here. Yes, yeah, sorry for being late. Teddy was a little restless tonight, so we had to uh, we had to work a little harder to get him to sleep. But he is now sleeping. So thank you for handling uh, the beginning of what may be the most disorganized episode of the assembly call ever. Because and that's <laughs> saying go, something. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, we don't have a run sheet. We kind of threw this together last minute because obviously we took last week off, and it's like, well, we should get back and do something. And this is kind of the last night to do it before before the games go on. So. This is going to be like our Ode to Crimson cast. We have a few general topics that we want to talk about, and we'll just kind of hit them as we go. Uh, I do want to say I'm glad you guys have talked about the women's basketball program. They were going to be, you know, what I talked about leading off. Banner moment, obviously, is winning an NCAA tournament game like that. Uh, and just, you know, and look, we all saw it, but just – Mackenzie Holmes and her leadership in that game and how much the moment meant to her. You know, I just think it was so special for everybody who was there, everybody who watched. Uh, that's what Indiana basketball is, man. And that, you know, for everybody who, you know, got emotionally invested in that game, that's one that you remember forever. And that's one that locks in young fans like – those are the moments we need on the women's side, on the men's side, uh, you know, to keep both programs moving forward. So just so proud of them and really excited about the opportunity against South Carolina. You know, they they beat South Carolina in 2019. Uh, I know, you know, it's a lot different. That was a younger team. It was early in the season. Um, but, hey, you go out, you have a good shooting night. As you guys just said, Coach, you just have to beat them once. In a seven-game series, South Carolina, their size, their athleticism, they're probably going to beat us 4-1 or 4-2. But you just have to win the one. And so get Sarah going, get Yarden going, Chloe doing all the little things. So very excited about that game. Uh, doing the work will go live immediately following it. And then before we dive into the other stuff, 
I am repping our friends at Home Field Apparel tonight with my bison snapback hat, which I absolutely love. Uh, and as always, we recommend that you go check out our friends at Home Field Apparel. Coach, you and Amy were both repping Home Field Apparel in the picture that you took at the Indiana yeah. State game. Would you have the crew neck and she had the hoodie, I think is how it was going. Yep. So that had was a very new nice. long sleeve t-shirt. And uh, yeah, and, and I, 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 um, I mentioned uh, in the ad, I already did the ad stuff uh, for us, Jared, but oh, um, okay. Connor, Connor had a little video there with the uh, people on the app or whatever whatever he calls all that. And he gave a preview of some of the products and we can't share, I can't share what I saw, uh, but what I saw, I'm going to be buying a lot of, um, there's some really good products coming out like the hat you're wearing and the other things you referenced. So nice. keep, keep up to date, even though basketball season and football season's over, keep refreshing the home field uh, page. Uh, there's going to be a lot of great stuff coming out. Very nice. Uh, by the so, way, Connor, Connor, a note, cause I know you're listening, uh, fitted. Let's, let's go get, give me a fitted. That's what I want. That's Dude, the snapbacks are so nice. I know. And no I hat has ever fit my head as good as this one. I'm I, telling you. I, and I, I'm not I a snapback guy I either. I don't. I, don't, I wasn't not either a, until I, I got this one. I can't wear a snapback backwards, and I, I do that all day. I flip them. I don't know why. You're it's a grown just, man. You shouldn't be wearing your hat backwards anyway. Okay, thanks, Colin Cowherd. Oh, come like, on. <laughs> come on, That was a good man. reference. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. That was good. Do you uh, wear that with a sports jersey when you go out in public too? Sports yeah, exactly. jersey and backwards hat. Is that duh? Yeah. <laughs> Who does basketball shorts? Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, our loose run sheet for tonight. I do have a thought on the in-state tournament. I'll provide that next. And then we're going to talk about the portal. Um, and we're not going to get too deep into individual players because I just think until there are commitments. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about guys who may or may not come. Specific. But I do are think at this point it, they really. Yeah. Are. You know, I do think even even though with some of the names that have been there, you're starting to see some priorities emerge. And so I think we're going to talk about that. Um, and then we got some really good mailbag questions. And so we'll hit those. And, you know, those of you who are here live, if you have stuff you want us to talk about, we'll be happy to. Um, the one thing I wanted to add about the NCAA tournament, I obviously watched the Texas A&M Houston game very closely uh, with my wife, who was very excited. <laughs> Man, it was funny. We were watching that Nebraska game. And at the beginning of it, Tominaga is just going nuts. And she's like what is this? I was like, I told you, you know, yeah, no. and then uh, you're, you're getting PTSD, like yeah. getting the shakes in the corner, yeah. honey, what's wrong with you? Uh. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, A&M played well, they win. And so then they play Houston. And I know a lot of people watch that game. That was a phenomenal yeah. basketball game. It wasn't always pretty, you know, but I'll say this, you know, all the stars in this tournament, Zach Eady and Donovan Klingon and Terrence Shannon, I don't know, man. If you give me my choice of one guy, I think I'll take my chances with Jamal Shedd. Yeah. I love that guy. I, I mean, think... he took Wade Taylor and just ground him up into a pulp. And, and Taylor was he, afraid. He wasn't even Houston's leading scorer. I, 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 I saw no. it at the end. I'm like, how? How but, was he not? Because you know, every is, man, he hit every important basket, and that's why you think he's the leading scorer for them. You know, He's also the kind of player you have to watch every possession yeah. to appreciate. He owned that entire game like he's just the alpha on and any then, college basketball court he steps onto right now they, so I don't know if he's good enough you know if they're going to be good enough to win and I'm it's weird because I don't want Houston to win but I love that kid I mean he well, is just such a great player all you need Did to you know see is the, that he stepped up to own the overtime too yes, when yeah. they had what four guys was it three guys or four guys yeah. fell out I was waiting yeah. for the Gene Hackman moment with Samson where he's like my team's on the floor because that's all I've got left at this <laughs> yeah. point I know well, and the kid, the kid exudes leadership too in, in many areas. You mentioned it, what you saw in the NCAA tournament, but there's that, uh, that yeah. the video that went viral of when he, they lost at Alabama and a coach kicked over the trash can and he's there and picking up, picking up the trash. And it, it's a, it's a little thing. I learned this from Don Meyer, who was an excellent coach at the, at Lipscomb and then at um, Northern State. Uh, 900 and some victories, uh, no longer with us, but he was a really good mentor for me, worked his basketball camps for seven, eight years, and he had a saying, pick up trash. Everyone picks up trash. Uh, no one's too big or too good enough to stoop down and pick up some trash. And, and, and I just think that shows, again, what he's doing in the locker room, what he's doing on the court. 
is he's handling all that stuff, and that's why Houston has been uh, one of the reasons why Houston is, is so good. And that's what I really like about college athletics. And you talk about Mackenzie Holmes and and some of the ladies that have come through the program and been there for a while. They that leadership is so needed to be uh, competitive and to advance in, in tournaments. Every once in a while, you'll get a team that maybe is disconnected that wins on talent alone, but leadership and and those things and competitiveness are skills. Uh, yeah. we, we're going to look at the portal, guys, about 17.1 and 40% shooting, and we're all looking at that and getting excited. But some of the intangibles that really good coaches have to unlock are those leaderships that Jamal Shedd has, that Mackenzie Holmes has, because that's going to lift everyone inside the program. And, and Shedd is one of the favorite players left in the, in the Sweet 16 for me as well. Because you were going to have to drive a stake through his heart to beat them. Yeah. I mean, you really are. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. – it's just – it, that was just stand over such the an impressive performance. Sure it's, it's not yeah. moving anymore. No, I, I wanted to ask you guys, of the teams remaining, forget like who you think is the best. and Because, I mean, we, I, I've been going with people on Purdue. Like, Purdue's really good, and they run a system that's perfect for them, but I don't like watching it. It's, it's, it's boring basketball for me, mostly, and it's kind of a grinded-out style. And I, I've been on this thing on, on social media just explaining it. Like, this is the system Purdue should be running with who they have. It's just not an enjoyable watching experience. Who is left that you really enjoy watching? Who are the teams that, like, if there are four games on at once, oh, I'm picking their game. I want to watch their game. I don't care what the score is. I want to watch them. Players, and and I know, obviously, Houston for, for Jared right now because of because of him, but but who, who do you enjoy watching play? And have you enjoyed watching play? I've, been, I've really enjoyed Marquette. I like watching them. I play. always love watching them. There's a real play. like that, that was going to be my answer as yeah. well. There's a real team feeling with them, and that's what Shaka's building. Actually, I didn't even realize Kolik was a transfer. He transferred mm-hmm. from where did he George where'd Mason. He transfer? Was, yeah, from George Mason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was two or three years ago, you know, but they've otherwise really kind of built some continuity, you know, with their team. Um, so, you know, I've always liked Shaka. I really enjoy watching them play. I've enjoyed watching NC State play. So, I mean, I think that game's going to be fun. Um, the the big guy on NC State, I think he's fun to watch. Um, he is and fun just, to watch. You know, but just see, their story is fun, you know, uh-huh. because everybody kind of scoffs. It's like, oh, yeah, you've got the conference tournament. It's like, well, they won't you do, five and games then and you five can make days. it to the Sweet 16. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I really so I've like really... – Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, finish. I think top I- – I was going to say, I've, I've actually, a team that I've really liked watching this year, and it's always a very disciplined team that runs it well, but I've really enjoyed watching Gonzaga this year. That was which the other one I was going to say, too. Their system usually is so post-heavy, because they'll usually have a, a post guy who's either going to go to the NBA or has been around forever. They're much more fluid this year, and I think that might be why it took them so long to get it going, and they're like, what, 16 of in two in their last 18 or something like that. Um and so, yeah, and the, and the losses were St. Mary's is a really good team, so it's, or at least one of them was. And, uh, yeah, so I've really liked watching the way they're playing. It feels like they're earning it. They're not just out-talenting everybody they're playing. It feels like they're outworking everybody, too. Yeah. I'm going to say Mar- Marquette. I-, I love Tyler Kolick. I think he's yeah. – I don't know. You, you can't – you say best, and it's not really fair because there's so many. But I just love the way he directs the offense, gets the gets the ball going in transition, and the way he can score around the rim, just extending. And, and I think they struggled when he was out for those six games and then for, to come back from an oblique and play as well as he did. But I love the way Shaka Smart coaches as well. And for me, it's a lot of coaches. Who do I like? Uh, what systems do they run? What kind of basketball do I like watching? And I just love this. I'm going to use this in my classroom is the EGBs. They track this, and he calls it energy generating behaviors. Yep. Diving on the floor, high fives, picking up. A f- when, when they get ready for three straight stops, I, I was behind their bench when they were at Butler, and everyone's yelling and crossing their, fi- their hands, kill, 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 and everyone on the bench is up doing that. Again, I think those things lift teams natural talent and they just run some f- free flowing stuff some reads uh things They're like high that energy I, at all times yeah and, and so you know i think that's just that's just good for all of us too How, what kind of day do you have when you provide energy for people i mean if you're an energy giver instead of an energy taker you're going to be productive in whatever business you run and i i just take that from him uh and coaching i love brad brunell uh, again, this personal, I spent, uh, I was very fortunate when he was at Wright State to be able to meet with him for six hours and just X and O on a, on a whiteboard. That, that, as a young coach, that's, that's cool when a college guy opens up his office, 
office and and does that. So I have a, always have a, a, a soft spot for his teams and want to see him win. And, and I, again, this is the where I'll get booed out of the the chat r- room. But I, I like uh, Underwood at Illinois. I know he's tough and rough, and we know, Coach. you know, we know. <laughs> yeah. So those are the three that I'm watching. Okay. But let's talk. Let's talk NIT though. There's a team to watch well, next on. Tuesday night. No, hold on, hold on. on I think on we should too. linger on. We need we need to linger on Underwood for a second. Because, you know, we give you a lot of crap for Underwood and, you know, they have underperformed. But there's a story that's been passed around. Several people um, have posted this in our Discord about, you know, how he he had this conversation with Jay Wright and decided, I need to build my roster for March. You know, we'll figure out a way to make it through the Big Ten, but I'm building this roster for March and kind of making some adjustments to what they were doing. And, you know, look what it's gotten them. No, they didn't win the Big Ten this year. But they've been incredibly fun to watch through a couple right. of games. Mm-hmm. You know, and they've got this versatility where they can play Coleman Hawkins at the five, who's a big man that can do a whole lot of things and step out. They can throw Danger in there if they feel like they've got a matchup on the block that they want to exploit. And they've just got all these other guys that can beat you in multiple ways. Shannon, Damask, you know, uh, Garrier, you know, all the guys. And then you got some specialists like Goody that just play their roles. I would list them as one of the teams I've really enjoyed watching, especially in March when it kind of feels like they're unleashed. And I think there's a good lesson there in, you know, and and that's the one thing Underwood has always done is not be dogmatic about the system, but kind of change to what he thinks is going to work and what fits his personnel and even adjust the system and then kind of recruit to it like he did this year to be ready for March, I think it's a re- I, I, I really I have to tip my cap to him, and I hope it's something that a lot of coaches around the country take a lesson from. Well, and a big major one was when he was at um, uh, SFA. What's what was that? What's Stephen the name F. of Austin. that school? Yeah, yeah. Stephen, F. Stephen F. Austin. They were a pressing team, and they were winning games against bigger teams because they were turning people over. And he came to Illinois, thought he could do that, and they were getting boat raced because they were out in passing lanes and getting driven. And Remember getting, the Rob Finnessy you know, game against Illinois that first year? Yeah, he just dominated so them. That's when he then decided after two years that he's got to he's got to change the way he does some things. And then he had the big guy and and the sumo, and and now he's he has changed and. And, you know, he has some newer philosophies. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I like, you know, Illinois, Marquette, and Clemson. Uh, I don't know how far any of those teams will advance, uh, but I do I'll like watching them. Uh, one team to keep an eye play. on, and, and I know, they're again, they're a one seed, but they are kind of flew under the radar all season, is North Carolina. Uh, they are – they're usually – you know, North Carolina is usually an up-tempo, high-scoring, fast team. They're also tough as hell. If you watch that Michigan State game – They got punched in the mouth to start it. We're down by, I think, 11. Hubert Davis took a timeout and just screamed at his team, and they did not get out physical after that. They absolutely. The best mid game interview ever. (laughs) One of the, I was so amazing. And then he went and yelled at his team, and I'm sure that it was the exact same thing he said on air was there. And they just were tough, man. They would not get pushed around. And, and I think it's just been interesting that they've, you know, Caleb loves leaves. He goes to Arizona helps galvanize that team, but him leaving, it just clearly wasn't a fit. And and him right. leaving allowed RJ Davis to do more. And, you know, they've taken off and Arizona's taken off. And it's just one of those things that's worked out for it's like when a, like when a baseball trade works out for both teams. That feels like that worked out for everybody perfectly. Except for Michigan. And, well, yeah, it's true. <laughs> nice job, guys. God, did Caleb love dodge a bullet there yeah. or what? But you're um, right. In in the basketball thing, they got a shot maker. Like RJ yeah. Davis can just win win any game. He's a it, he's a marked player. You're playing man. bad or or whatever. He's just a dagger. Uh, and, and I think you need to win a game or two like that on your six game streak to a national championship. And when you have that guy uh, that you can do, and a lot of teams do, but I mean he's extraordinarily good at it. But the nice thing is they pair him with a more balanced roster because Tyson Walker is that guy. But Michigan State just didn't have enough other right. stuff, especially down. Baycott low. in the middle is a threat, yeah. and exactly. Exactly. Ingram or whatever, yep. Yeah. So, okay, Coach, you were getting ready to talk about the NIT, and obviously another thing that was getting passed around today was Indiana State's shot chart from that Cincinnati <laughs> game, where it's literally – it is it is complete. It's just – there's just like circles all around the three-point line and then just around the basket, and there's one little mid-range shot, like a little 12-footer from the right side. That's it. That was the whole shot diet for the entire game. I'm curious what it was like actually watching that in person. It – um. You know, 
I'm a big fan of college basketball. Obviously, my allegiance is to IU and anyone playing IU. But my son being there, there's a, and my niece is a volleyball player, and it's just good to see a town revitalized again. I mean, that place was hopping from the restaurant we went to to the the tavern to the little tent city with the music going before. The, it just you know, it's the NIT, but it it was just huge for that community. And, and that's, you know, you got a coach that came in there and lost uh, a lot his first year and then second year had a good year and then third year built something absolutely incredible. And the way they play, you know, Amy was talking last, she said again today, she goes, that was one of the most fun games that I've watched. And the pace, they're fast and they're at the rim or then they're shooting threes and they're, the back cuts, um, it is it is just so pleasing uh, to, to watch. And again, when my son was a manager, you could, you know, hear every conversation in the building. There was hardly anyone in there and to see, you know, 10, 12,000 people last night. And now it's, uh, moving to Hinkle for the finals and, and it's sold out in like an hour. Um, luckily I already had my tickets for that, but it's going to be a fun atmosphere. Um, you know, the NIT again, a lot of people may not be interested in it and I haven't been in the past, but college basketball is pretty good. Even even some of those teams that didn't make the NCAA, they have a lot to play for. And and Indiana State and those players and that coach are, are doing some some fun things. I got to take off, guys. By the way, uh, just something's come up. But uh, enjoy the rest of the show, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I got to get out of here. Thanks. Damn, they've had enough show apparently. Uh, at least enough show with Ryan. We're still going to be here. Hey, where did you <laughs> fall on? Um, I don't even think we've talked since the selection show. Where did you fall on the whole? Indiana State should they or should they have not been in debate? I assume you. Uh, had we had, we had them out. Um, we did. We had them out because the the qualify the uh, bid stealers. Um, we we had them actually. I think the f uh, second team out, second or third team out. So they would have made it if North Carolina State or Oregon would have lost uh, in that tournament. We we had them. We had them in going into Friday, and then as Just teams not enough got, quality. Um. Yeah. You know. per, obviously, we all wanted them in um, and, and thought they need to be in, but what the committee is tasked with, they were just on that 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 cut line. And so, when you had a couple conference winners go for, you know, unexpected winners, those were Indiana State got cut. So technically, yeah, they kind of made it uh, until the tournaments on Friday and Saturday night turned differently, and then um, you had to Would cut you... teams. You know, Oklahoma got cut; they deserved yeah. it as well. So. Would you advocate for expanding the tournament to like 72 and having more initial play in games so that a team like that gets in or even expanding it more so that more of the smaller teams have a chance? Yeah, Jared, the, 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 the answer for me is no, but I'm leaning towards it. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I always think it's unfair that the 16 seeds have to play in until I saw the joy in Wagner's locker room. And it really hit me this year. Like they, they were this our first ever NCAA tournament win. They were jumping up and down, and and, and then on on our website DelphiBracketology.com, I seeded a seventy six team. Just threw something together instead of teaching one day. I was throwing together using using what the NCAA committee had uh, up through nine ten seeds, and then making a couple of adjustments, and basically taking uh, the the what was it the. Um, it would be the 16 bottom teams and pairing them together, and the winners would be 15 and 16s, and then pairing the last eight at-larges into automatic 12s. And I just wanted to see what it would look like. And I don't think it, I, I don't think it takes away from what we have. Um, and the other thing that I thought, Jared, is now you have eight teams that are going to get NCAA tournament wins that normally would be 15 and 16 seeds or 14 seeds and get maybe blown out in that first game. Yes, they get to go and experience a Friday night or a Thursday night, but now eight teams are going to get a win and get that. And maybe that's soft. I don't know. But these kids play hard at those smaller levels too. And to have the opportunity to win a game and then go play Purdue or win a game and then go play Kentucky, um, you know, you don't see too many 15-2 upsets or 14, three upsets, uh, every once in a while you do, but this gives those teams a chance. And plus then you have some teams that are very deserving, like Oklahoma, and Indiana state that can go and, and also play, play in. And I think the division one has expanded and the tournament it went from 48 to 64 to 68 and we all didn't maybe like it. And then we got used to it. So I don't want to see 96 teams in. I think that would just totally be crazy, but I think you can add 
anywhere up to eight and not really tear away from the bracketology being selfish um, and from the yeah. the fun. And and we, we suggested play it at Hinkle, four games at Hinkle, Tuesday and Wednesday, four That'd games cool. at Dayton, four games at the Palestra. Oh, I mean, man. you're bringing the history of college cool. in. You're yeah. bringing the history of college basketball that's on TV. You got you you know you're a 14 seed you know or 15 seed team, and you get to go play at the Palestra that you normally wouldn't. Um, I think there's some inherent benefits if it's. I I, don't, I want to stay away from the participation trophy stuff where everyone you know gets a win. I, I don't like yeah. that either. But I did see the joy in that Wagner team, uh, and even Grambling that. You can have six of those, and then they're still in, in in the tournament. Plus, you have teams like ISU that need to be in, and Oklahoma that need to be in. Um, yeah. so I'm leaning I'm leaning more to it. Yeah, I think I'm with you. You know, just to make sure that those teams that are deserving, like an Indiana State, get in. I would rather err on the side of those teams getting in, and maybe you know you have a couple of teams that you're like, yeah, they don't belong in the tournament. But we got all the teams that deserve right. it in. I agree with you on giving the smaller schools more of their, you know, kind of moments in the sun. And man, I hadn't even thought about kind of playing it at some of those historic arenas. That, that, that'd be cool. Now I wouldn't expect like, like Indiana did not deserve to go to the tournament this year. You right. know? So I wouldn't expand it out to 96 where even Ohio just giving State. All, yeah. Like it's not, I'm not in favor of just giving the power five teams a pass, but I am in favor of making the tournament more interesting. And I think the smaller schools, the more styles, you know, all that stuff, I think makes it more interesting. So I'm with you on yeah. that. Um, all right. Let's talk about the Hoosiers. Um, you know, obviously a big, big portal season for Indiana. You know, as we kind of reset where we're at right now um, with CJ Gunn, Caleb Banks, Peyton Sparks, all transferring. Um, and maybe let's pause just for a minute here real quick. You know, Xavier Johnson, Anthony Walker, obviously gone. Khalil Ware to the NBA draft. Um, you know, Indiana had an open scholarship already. So now you got gun bank sparks going back to ball state, which I think is great. Everybody's happy for him. That's a good fit. Uh, any other thoughts on the guys who are leaving, especially where gun and banks who are leaving, um, you know, by their own choice. No, I, I think, you know, where you just got to give kudos to where for coming in, had a tough season, uh, with high expectations at Oregon when you, when you're, you know, a top 10 type of recruit and it doesn't go your way to come in here and, and kind of quiet all of those concerns. Obviously, yeah. there are things that his game needs to do and strength and all of those things, but the young man came and competed. Uh, you know, very rare were there moments uh, where he didn't leave it uh, on the floor and and he got better. And so you take your hat off and you say good luck to him and, and I think he's going to be a back-end first round or maybe even higher, but a second-round pick likely to go. Um, you know, I don't know that there's much of a chance of him – uh, coming back, but yeah, that's that's just good to see uh, for a young man being able to accomplish that. For the guys who chose to leave, uh, that's part of the transfer portal um, that you you get to go and, and and try to find a place which is a better fit. I, I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any ill will. I'm going to be a CJ Gun fan and 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 Caleb Banks and Peyton Sparks and and wish them well unless they play Indiana and then I wish they have a one off night. Um, <laughs> I do think. I do think those young men can find fits where they can enjoy uh, and have some success. And it is just, you know, you mentioned Tyler Kolick. Tyler Kolick leaves George Mason, and he went and was developed for two or three years under under a good coach, and, and it, that was transferring up. And sometimes players need to transfer down if that's their fit. So, yeah, nothing nothing negative about the, those guys uh, leaving. I, I wish them the best. I, I think – I think CJ is going to find a spot and going to unlock uh, what we saw at the, in the Big Ten tournament there at the end when he just felt a little more free and was able to, you know, he's a volume guy. And he's yes. going to have to go where you saw what happened when he got volume of shots, the ball went in and he scored points. Uh, he needs to be in a system that's, that's volume for him, and I hope he finds it, and I hope the system that grabs him uh, unleashes that potential. I, I think you'll see it in him. Caleb uh, maybe go to Stetson and small take – Take, yeah, take Jalen exactly. Blackman's spot at Stetson. But, you know, Caleb is stuck between that four and that three, and he's still got some development to do. But I, I'm sure there's a program there, too, where he can he can maximize his, his skills and his ability. But at, at young players, I, I will never be glad to see people go or, or be upset with them for, for leaving. It's the way of the world now, and they're free to do that, and I wish them nothing but the best. 
Yeah, I think all three choices made sense on both sides. You know, I think Indiana needs – there is so much riding on next season. Indiana needs guys who they can count on to produce. You know, and, and I think we all feel positive about what CJ and Caleb can develop into. But, you know, it's just a statistical fact that the trajectory that they're on is not real promising for becoming a difference maker as a junior and senior at the power conference level. Doesn't mean they can't, you know, maybe they could do it at another school in a different system. Totally agree with you on CJ. I agree on Caleb. I don't think the system, you know, it, it's really hard, I think, you know, when you watch a player and you feel like, man, the system is like accentuating all the stuff they don't do well, and it's not really allowing them to do the things they do well. And I felt like that a lot of times with CJ and Caleb. And so I think they can find better fits. And I think Indiana can find better fits. And I think the same thing right. with Peyton Sparks. And, you know, I think both guys were recruits worth taking a chance on. And I think for them, coming to Indiana was a good choice. It just doesn't work out. And so as much as the transfer portal is kind of annoying in a way and it creates all this upheaval and I think we'd all like rosters to be a little bit more stable, I think th these are success stories, I think, for the transfer portal where you have guys that are just in a bad situation, a bad fit for themselves. And for the program, you figure it out after two years and they can both go their separate ways and hopefully be better for it. So so I, I agree with you on those. And now we're left with a roster that currently includes at guard, Gabe Cups, Trey Galloway, and Ja'Kai Newton. At wing, Anthony Leal and Mackenzie Mbako. We, you know, we think that Mackenzie Mbako will come back. Uh, and Malik Renew. Am I missing anybody? Am I, am no, missing we should anybody? have six. Yeah, but that's is that that's counting Mbako, right? Yes. So right. That, I, I, believe, I believe that's everybody. Let me know, chat mob. It's late in the night. Um, so Newton, yeah, so you we have, mentioned Newton, right? Yeah, Newton. Yeah, so we have seven yeah. scholarships to fill if you assume that McKenzie and Baco is coming back. I think, you know, one thing just to that people I think should be aware of is there's a very good chance that both McKenzie and Baco and Malik Renew will declare for the NBA draft. The reason they will do that is not necessarily because they're committed to staying in the NBA draft. It's because you have to declare to get feedback. So don't freak out if Malik does it. I think he mentioned that on the Hoosier Hysterics podcast, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, that he was going to do that so that he could get feedback. And we know Mbako will. Um, Renew almost, you know, is, I mean, he's coming back. And Mbako, I think, unless he gets feedback where, it's, you know, some team is just in love with him and is going to take him, then I guess that could change his mind. Otherwise, I would assume he'll be back. So this is the core that Indiana's building around, Coach. You've got... You know, Malik Renew, who I think is probably an odds-on favorite to be a first-team preseason All-Big Ten selection, because, and maybe this is a subject for another show, but there's a lot of high-end talent leaving the Big Ten. Edie's gone, Shannon's gone, Bowie's gone, Tyson Walker's gone. Um, you know, a lot of those guys that entered the season as first-team All-Conference picks were first-team All-Conference picks. I think next year it's going to feel a lot more wide open. But Renew is a guy that I think is going to be on a lot of people's first team um, or second team. You know, Mbako, I mean, he's got the kind of potential where he could be a 15, 16 point score as a sophomore. And so I think you'll probably see him on some of those lists just because of the recruiting pedigree. He was Big Ten freshman of the year. He's obviously got the talent. So those are the two high talent guys that you're building around. Probably going to be your two leading scorers, depending on who else they get. Then you've got a senior in Trey Galloway who's played a ton of basketball, can be very versatile, you know, and can really fit in to a lot of different lineups depending on what you get. Um, Ja'Kai Newton, total wild card. We have no idea what the health is going to be or how ready he'll be for big time basketball after so much time off. You know, Anthony Leal kind of is what he is. And I think you saw the value that he can provide at the end of the season. I also think it's fair to say you probably don't want him as high up in the rotation as he was at the end of the season if this team is going to be competing for a Big Ten title or in the NCAA title. And look, maybe that's me underselling him again, and he'll prove that wrong. But I think what you saw this season is, hey, this guy can do some things. He's not just an end of the bench guy. And so I think it's nice to have him, but you still need to try and upgrade on the wings. And then same with Gabe Cups, who I think showed he can be an excellent depth piece at guard. But again, at this stage in his development, you probably don't want to count on him for heavy minutes. So that leaves us with seven spots to go out in the, in, in, into the portal and get. And we're starting to see some of Indiana's priorities emerge. You know, one of the names that you've heard is Tony Perkins, a guard from Iowa who's from Indianapolis, was second team all Big Ten this year. Not a great shooter, 
good tough defender, good assist rate. Like he's just a solid Big Ten guard. And I think with that experience, you know, would help Indiana upgrade that position. But this is my first question to you, Coach, when it comes to recruiting priorities. You know, you look at a guy like Perkins, and and I have no idea if Indiana's going to get him where we are in his pecking order, but I just think he's an interesting archetype to use for the discussion. He is a guy who would definitely raise the floor for Indiana, you know, at, at guard, give us better than what we got last year. Um, even most of the time when X was healthy, Tony Perkins was p- playing at a higher level than what X was. But to get a guy like Tony Perkins, he's probably not coming from Iowa for anything less than a starting role, I wouldn't think. So would you lock in a guy like Tony Perkins right now and say, here, we're going to give you the ball. You go be our lead guard. You know, we want to solidify this position. Or do you hold out and try and get more of a quote unquote difference maker at that position? Like if this was you setting the the priority for Indiana basketball, because I think we all agree that position is of extreme importance. So, you know, take him as kind of the baseline. Yeah. What are you um, going to do? I think you have to – I think there's two things. I think you have to go for some real top-end talent, but you also need to really hit home runs for that next level. And I think that's that's just not – that's Mike Woodson. That's everybody who's got more than two or three spots. Um, I, I think in Coach Woodson's system, the point guard has to be really, really dynamic. Uh, and so the question would be, do you take a Perkins early – and miss out on someone who would be a little more dynamic, a little more special at the point guard. I would probably think you have to do a little bit better than that uh, in order for uh, – in Mike Woodson's system, he he loves that point guard and that ability to score and get to the rim and do some of those things. And if Perkins fits, then, yeah, take him. I, I, I And, again, I'm not the best talent evaluator uh, th- there is, but I, I would think that you're going to get another uh, shot-blocking rim runner – high talent because you've put a couple of those guys in the pros. I think those guys are one are going to come to Indiana. That's Woodson's calling card right now. And I think he can get that. That fits into Mike Woodson's system. Then replacing X, uh, you know, a lot of thoughts on X, but we were better when X was playing and playing good basketball. And X was up and down with injuries over the last two years. I don't know that we saw as consistent as we possibly could. But he, he won with Hood Shafino, and he won in the Big Ten tournament the X's first year with a really, really good, quick ball pressure. So, again, I, I don't know a whole lot about Perkins, and I'm taking a back seat on the portal. I thought last year um, – Everyone gets excited hearing names, and then you know it didn't. It wasn't the right fit. I have three categories in general when we want to talk about it that I think uh, where I'm coming from as a fan that that needs to happen, and then trusting the coaching staff to get those names right yeah. um, because we're in contact with 20 or 30 people, and you're going to see a lot of points per game and played at Iowa. You're going to get excited, but maybe there's a point guard that was from Drexel or something that really. You know, the, the kid from Harvard, Mac, is is available. And, and you know, so so I think, you know, again, not commenting on liking system, disliking system, whatever, but Coach Woodson's system loves good point guards and loves rim running post. That's where you're going for the high end. Then you got to fill in some time. You know, you got the threes and the fours kind of locked up. Um, in a two, three, four, if you put Galloway and, and Baco and renew at those spots, you have those locked up. So now you got to find those gems that can come and compete or come and play behind or, or get some minutes and buy into the system or those guards that can shoot. Um, that's where I think you can maybe take a risk early with someone um, because you have, you know, you have some perimeters already uh, that are that are there. So I would say the point guard. You want to make sure you hit the hit the best point guard you possibly can, and not go early. Take the names away from it, maybe. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you. And I'm I'm approaching the portal a lot differently this year than I did last year. You know, last year it was yeah. Dalton Connect, and we got a Zoom, and and we get you know Nicholas yeah. Timberlake, and we get all excited about these guys that we never actually really had a chance with. And there's just so much noise with the portal. And, you know, this is not to denigrate the great work that I think Jeff Rabjohns is doing at Peegs and that Alex is doing it inside the hall. And there's there's a reason why this stuff is getting tracked. And it's there if you want to get into the minutia. Like, it can yeah. be fun and exciting. I've just decided to kind of take a step away from a lot of the noise. Me too. And when we hear about a visit 
or it's th something starts to get serious, I may start looking, you know, a little bit more, but I really just want to see who are the guys. I mean, we need seven of them, you know? Yep. And so again, I think Perkins is interesting because I think he's, you know, he's the type of guy that I think Indiana is going to be able to get. Like, I think whether it's Perkins or somebody else, you'll be able to get a guy like that. And obviously, if you could take a guy like Perkins and slot him in as in like a like as your backup point guard or a supporting role, you would take him in a heartbeat. But he's overqualified for that role. And the the thing I think that we have to remember as IU fans is you know, last year we were coming off a really exciting season, second in the Big Ten, four seed. Trace Jackson Davis is an All-American. There's a lot of hype, and it really felt like we were building towards something. Those are the types of teams that typically get the best players in the portal, and we did. We landed one of the 10 most talented players in Khalil Ware in the portal. I don't know that we're going to do that this season. Now, maybe. I'm not ruling it out, but, you know, when you listen to shows like X's and Joe's and kind of just look at the history of it, the top players, you know, tend to go to teams that were successful the year before, that went to the tournament, that, you know, kind of have some good vibes going. You know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Arkansas this year because they fell flat, um, you know, but they've been very successful in the portal. Indiana is hoping that the great equalizer is NIL money because it seems Indiana basically just has an open checkbook to just go, you know, pay whatever they want. But, you know, a lot of guys who are coming out, they're looking for more than just – NIL money, you know, they're look, you know, a guy like, you know, well, forget the names, as you said, but they're looking for maybe opportunity or fit, or how do I showcase myself for the next level? Or, you know, I've been on a middling team, and I want to play on a good team, you know, so there's a lot of other things that can go in there. And unfortunately, there's also a lot of valid, negative recruiting stories that people can tell about Indiana right now. And Indiana has to combat those both with their own storytelling and with the money. Um, but that's what's going to make this really interesting because, you know, Malik Mack is an interesting name from Harvard. We all saw him play, you know, and he comes out. A lot of people thought, hey, maybe he's going to Maryland. Well, Maryland signed somebody else, you know, so maybe there is a chance with Mack. But is is Indiana going to be that high up on his list? I don't know. He I mean, I, he's a guy if he wanted to come, you take him in a second. Number one, he's young. He can develop. He is that dynamic guy that can score and create, you know, for other people. So you would take him in a second, but it's just, is Indiana going to actually have a chance there? And, you know, you mentioned the other position. I mean, I think in terms of priorities, dynamic point guard is number one, a guy who can score at multiple levels and create. And then, you know, clearly, you know, the other two are going to be, you know, a, a guard or a wing that can score in multiple ways, preferably, preferably as a shooter, but also someone who can drive. And then, uh, you know, a rim runner and rim protector at center. You know, what I don't think Indiana wants is another back to the basket center. Because <laughs> if you get another back to the basket center, now it kind of feels like you're pigeonholed into kind of playing the same system uh, that we've been playing. And no one certainly wants to see that. So, you know, I think if, if we agree on the point guard, then as you're looking at the next priority, what do you think is more important? You know, is it more important to to go get that dynamic offensive player on the wing, or to get that to get the big man down low? And I know they're both important. Yeah, but again, it, it's got to be the fit to the system and the coach. Uh, I think coach likes those rim runner back to the basket post players, and he's put two of them in. He's put two of them in the NBA uh, with TJD and Ware. So I think I would not be surprised to see one um, the the next Ware, the next TJD. Uh, because that's smart for well, see, but where was a little bit different though because he could face the basket and he didn't necessarily have to have you know he didn't have to have but, his back to the basket to be successful yeah but i think you're going to get a kid similar to him and then you're i mean aware point two or 2.0 type of kid but i just think coach likes that um uh, and you kind of have to there's have good reasons playing renew yeah. before yeah, and, at and at least if you're on using the defensive end you know, there's some benefits to that. There's the shot blocking. There's the rim running. If you have a dynamic point guard, pick and roll, throw in the lob. Those are all things that Coach Woodson likes to do. So why wouldn't he recruit those kids to that, to that, those positions? Um, you know, uh, until and, and if he's changing what he's doing, we're not going to know about it. And I understand that, right? Um, so, but we may so get a hint to, based on the prior, right, by, based on how they yeah. recruit. Yeah. yeah so um, that, but that's the other you know, thing there's a to difference watch, between. I think. Yes, I think that's good to watch. You know, what I would like to do is, 
is have Renew play the five that takes away a little bit of rim protection. But then Mbako is really good when they went three guards and he, he was driving fours uh, and guarding fours. I thought his back end of the season was fantastic. And some of that was because he had some time uh, playing the four uh, and, and not the three. So, uh, But it's, it's different between what other teams are doing and what we see other teams doing, like I would love a movement shooter. I, I Josh, uh, a, a young basketball coach in Illinois, Josh Hauser, it talks. We talk back and forth on a direct message, and and he mentioned this about movement shooters. But those are movement guys that come off screen, heel, toe, toe, rise up and hit shots. And we have not seen that in in an Indiana system in three years. So why would you recruit that? You know, and a coach has to believe in a system. Uh, and and. You know, I, I, I have uh, high praise for that. If you believe in your system, then you got to recruit to your system, and then you just got to win with your system. And and right now it's basically one and a half years out of three that they won with that system, uh, maybe two out of three to be fair getting to the tournament. So why not? I, I think you're going to see uh, – I was thinking the Zeisloff type shooter where you need good step-in shooters that can hit 38 42% on kickouts from driving kicks, more so than movement shooters and – and off of off of screens, and your comment about a guy who can shoot and deck it, I think that's vital in a Mike Woodson system. So uh, I think you're going to see. I, I I hate to say this, I think you're going to see three bigs come in, very similar to what last year because of backup and rotation pieces. You're going to see one wing, and you're going to see a couple guards. So that's six spots, and then the seventh one will be uh, filling in. But there's a lot of behind that too, is like who you're going to get and how they're going to fit in. Uh, and that's where I've come up with my three different categories just in college basketball in general. Well, and um, let's get to those, but I want to clarify something. Are you – because I agree with you. I think that is what we're likely to see because I'm not right. going to really believe we're going to change anything until I see it. Are you endorsing that? Like do you think that's the way it should be, or have you just resigned yourself to the fact that this is how we're going to play yeah. under Mike Woodson, and so we need to recruit to the way he wants to play to maximize that way? Yes. Um, obviously, I like the Indiana State and the Marquette way of playing basketball with the five and, and the Illinois. That's what Brian Tonsoni prefers to watch. But I prefer to watch Indiana win. And Mike Woodson is our coach. And Mike yeah. Woodson has to be comfortable. And Mike Woodson has been able to bring in talent and develop fives. And, and he got to two tournaments. Those are all things that we cannot deny, whether we like the scheme or do not like the scheme. And he deserves the right to coach the players in a scheme that he wants to. And then the pressure's on him to make sure that it gets another four seed or five seed and gets Indiana back to the top with that system and prove that his system is right. Or like Underwood, he says, you know what? We tried this for three years. We're going to go in a different direction. That is still a possibility. But Mike Woodson needs to coach Mike Woodson's team. I, I have I have no problem with that. Uh, obviously, I would prefer watching Marquette and Illinois play offense and defense than watch Indiana from a basketball standpoint. But I, I prefer Indiana winning. And if Coach Woodson can get Indiana winning with his guys and his system, I'm all for that. Um, so I don't know if that's advocating for that or just – as a coach, no, I, I get, I get. I appreciate Coach Woodson having to do what he wants to do, and 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 I'm going to back off a little bit of the, you know, obviously I don't like it, but it's yeah. Coach's team, and he's our coach, yeah. and he has my support, and if he needs to recruit three post players and and go that way, then I hope it works, and and, and I want it to work. Uh, that's yeah. just where I've I've resided in the in the last uh, you know few weeks, but I, I just think I just think that's fair. I, I don't think. You, I, I can, know. yeah, I can disagree with it, but coach needs to, you know, coach shouldn't be coaching for Brian Tonsoni. He should be coaching for Indiana University and what he feels best and making his best professional decisions. And I'm sure he does. He could care less about about those things. So that's why I think you're going to see that because we've seen it in three years. Yeah. No, I, it's a really good perspective. I think everybody knows where we stand on, you know. Mike Woodson as the coach and what we would have preferred to see happen. But here we are, and Mike Woodson is the coach, and it's still Mike Woodson, and we support Indiana basketball and support him. And I, I think you're right. If you're if that's the mindset you're going to have, then you know you, you have to support him building the team how he wants yes. to do it, whether you like it or not. Now, I, I but th this is where I would say, you know, pay attention to some of these guys that they're bringing in and some of what they do, because I think if there is going to be a change, you have to recruit to the change. Now, I guess the other option would I be, agree. you know, the other option would be, hey, guys, you know, this, you know, Coach Woodson speaking to his staff, we've got all this NIL money. We need talent. 
Let's go get the best talent that we can, and we'll figure out how to make it work. And if that means I need to adjust, maybe I need to adjust. I'm not saying he will say that. I'm saying that's the other thing that, that could be happening. We won't know until we start to see some of these players come in. Um, okay, you've got your three, your three categories. What are they? Yeah, and I was just thinking about this because, man, every all list. This guy's been contacted by eighteen player or eighteen schools, and you you kind of get excited and, and and you're interested. And we just have to be resolved that it's not really program building anymore. It's just team building. Team building. The twenty four twenty five team building, and then twenty five twenty six. I still think you can combine that, and I want to do some research maybe for the next show we do uh, and look at the Sweet 16 teams and how many two- or three-year guys they have, whether they recruited them as freshmen and are on the team or they brought in a transfer that was a freshman or a sophomore transfer, and then they played in that system for two or three years. Like because Kolek I think Coach Woodson, like Tristan Newton and yeah, Terrence Think Shannon about Coach Woodson's best year uh, was last year. You had veterans. You had a transfer yeah. in Miller Cop who was in his fifth year, second year under Woodson. You had TJD in his fourth year. You had Race Thompson in his sixth year. You had Trey Galloway in his third year. There's a reason that team won. They were, had some talent. They had some great freshmen from Mount Verde to back up, and, and eventually Shafino took over so you could withstand injuries. That, I think, that combination of bringing new people in and veterans is, is what I think is going to win in the NCAA. Uh, and it doesn't mean just freshman re high school recruits. You can bring in a – a younger transfer that stays for a while. Um, but just six or seven new guys every year. Coach Woodson said they had took a long time to understand each other and a long time to understand the defense, and it kind of kicked in uh, with some roster help uh, or some scheduling help at the end to win five in a row. But you can't wait. You got to gel in late November, um, and, that's, and, and so that's, you know, that's, that's one of the concerns. But you had those veteran guys. Um, yep. and I think that's, that's what you're seeing a little bit here, uh, in, in the NCAA tournament is you do have some transfers, but you have some second, third, fourth year guys that are winning Kentucky in, in Calipari is just getting drilled down there because he's been in the every year, new team, every year, new team, every year, new team. And since 2000, what, 18, 19, whenever he hasn't had any success in the tournament. So, um, you know, but yep. I, I, Anyway, my, my three categories, you got to get talent. And, and, and yes. usually you're going you're to get talent. And then hidden in there, Jared, is that talent to fit in. Like you, you see Domask at, at Illinois, but you had two studs around him. Well, we have a couple studs coming back. So should you don't necessarily look at the top five in any list or top ten in any list, you might be able to identify some talent that fits into Mbaco, that fits in with Renew. Uh, that's a skill in coaching, and, and again, that's across the NCAA board. Uh, you you have to get good guys, and you have to get talent, so that's a given. But then the fit, and, 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 and I think there's two things from my coaching perspective. The fit has to be roster. It has to fit together to run your defensive scheme, your offensive scheme. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I worry about just getting the best talent and then fitting them into your set scheme. I think you were correct. If you get a lot of talent, then you might have to find the best scheme for that. Uh, as opposed to just a talent accumulation into a, a, a particular thing, but also competitive fit. You know, yeah. Domas, Jones at Purdue, uh, Kolick uh, at Marquette. These kids want to win. Uh, Spencer uh, at, at Connecticut. They want to win. And in this day and age, and I'm not, I don't want this to be Indiana specific, but when you're getting paid, there are pros that get paid a lot of money that will knock your, your head off to win. And then there are pros that have made a lot of money that coast and never maximize their ability because the yeah. money. Well, you're going to see that in college too. The kids, some kids will get millions in NIL and they'll dive on the floor and they'll be the first one to practice and the last one to practice. And then there'll be others that get some NIL and they're doing shots at Kilroy's more important and all of that stuff's more important than winning basketball games, right? So you got to have a competitive fit. And I don't know how you do that in you got to do a lot of research, and that's again that psychology part of coaching. But I think to be clear, that was not a specific shot. That was not a veiled shot at anybody. You were just using Kilroy no. as an example. <laughs> I just want to be yeah. clear about that. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> and then basketball IQ. Um, yeah. I think you know that that's a skill too, is understanding stuff. I thought you saw. Um, I think you saw Mbako's knowledge of basketball get better over the year, but when he came in, he was he was struggling to understand basketball at the level, college level, of just angles and how to close out and how to switch and how to communicate and do all that. If you're going to get a guy that has played, 
you may, you want to make sure they're ready. Um, you know, from a basketball IQ, because we have taken too long to gel under Mike Woodson, uh, for whatever reason. And if that's on the players, that's also on the coaches for getting the type of players that take a while. You can't really wait in college 15 games in to really get it because you lose your non-conference uh, opportunities and then then all of the qualifications for tournament, uh, you're, you're behind the eight ball like Indiana was uh, all year this year. So, you know, talent, go out and get good talent, but get the fit. I think you really got to think about how your system works and, and what's best. And sometimes you might have to pass on a guy like this guy's really, really good, but we have too many uh, threes or we have too many fours. It's okay to pass instead of trying to, you know, uh, force things together uh, and then make sure you have some toughness and some uh, basketball IQ. You talk about women's basketball, they're tough. They were down, they were hit in a couple times, and they have that toughness, right? They just have a toughness. I think as much as uh, we can pinpoint all of our complaints about Indiana basketball, their up and down inconsistency was a lack of, of toughness. Not playing hard, not effort, they're not dogging it. Just a refusal to get beat, refusal to give up a rebound, refusal to, to not block out. Um, so can I think you need to recruit that. You know the other thing that you need, Coach? It goes along with toughness, but it's trust. And I bring that word up because Malik Renew brought that word up on the Hoosier Hysterics podcast. I really, I really recommend that episode to everybody. I really think everybody should listen to it. I thought Malik really provided a lot of insight into how he made the decision to come back. Uh, you know, really, I think showed a lot of self awareness about what he needs to improve on. And I think when he was talking about, you know, why did it take so long? Like, why did this season take so long? And, and why were you able to gel at the end? The answer is basically we started trusting each other more. You know, it took a while. And, you know, there were a lot of new pieces. There were a lot of injuries. You know, and again, those things, they can be used as excuses, but they're also explanations for why teams don't gel. Um, but, you know, you got to figure out a way to, to get teams to do that more. And, and this is where I think your point about, you know, not just building completely new rosters all the time, but having a stable foundation there that guys can come into and kind of fit into like a Lance Jones did at Purdue or like Damask did at Illinois, because man, you, you know, you talk about a defining characteristic about the IU women's program right now, it's trust. They won that game against Oklahoma because they trusted each other. You know, they got down by four and they knew, Hey, we can go into McKenzie Holmes. She's going to get us buckets and Chloe Moore McNeil is going to help us get stops. And Yarden's going to make that little 17 footer when we give it to her. And Sarah's going to make the free throws. Like there's just, there's a trust and a belief in each other. And, you know, when Malik said that, it really hit me and it kind of colored in a lot of what we were watching. You know, we were watching players that didn't trust each other. And when they did, you know, they and it's not like a, a light bulb just went off. I mean, I think they did get to the end of the season and think, hey, let's just let's go out there and let's come together and do this. But there were also basketball reasons. They learned each other's games more. They knew more where guys were going to be. They understood where McKenzie wanted to be to get his shots, you know, and, and all those different things. That stuff just takes time, <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, the, the Bill Simmons book of basketball where Isaiah Thomas gives him the secret about basketball, right? Which is that it's not about basketball. It's about the other stuff. It's about trusting each other. I mean, that's to me, that's why basketball is the best game. You know, because it takes five people really being on the same page, plus all the bench guys. And it, it, that's, it just seemed like a disjointed mess so often last season. And that's part of what made the end of the season so rewarding to watch is it's like, yeah, this is more what it's supposed to look like. And that, to me, is the big challenge now for Indiana. You know, this season especially, where you're bringing in so many new people, but also as you try to build for the future, laying a foundation while also trying to build immediate rosters, you've got to have some continuity somewhere to, to build that trust. That's what Indiana had with Trace and Race and, and all, you know, and Miller and these guys, you know, that had at least all played together for one season, Trace and Race a lot longer. And you look at a lot of the teams now that are still playing, they trust each other, you know? And so how do you, how do you build that? And I think a lot of the things you just outlined are a big part of it. You know, high basketball IQ, knowing where each other are going to be, knowing that the guy's going to make the right read, you learn to trust each other. You know, having good competitiveness, like knowing that that next guy is going to dive on the floor just, at, you know, at the same rate that you are, or is going to step up and take a charge if, you know, if your man beats you. That kind of trust, it doesn't show up in a box score, and yet you know it when you see it. You know, like those Houston guys, man, I mean, they trust each other to no end. 
and they trust Jamal Shedd. You know, I mean, it was just it was so eye opening watching them. You know, and so that same thing with Indiana it, State. Yes, how do you build? You that? could just tell. You could just yes. tell. Yeah, um, totally. But you you need continuity, and you need, uh, and again, um, this one's on the players. It's hard for a coach to coach that. Like, yeah. you, you know, you can you can try to build that, um, but the players, you know, we always joke about playing, saying playing for the name in front of, of the jersey, not in the back. But there's some reality to to that. A coach can't ma- wave the magic wand. They can do some things, and we're all responsible as coaches to do those things. But that's one of the things that I'll take off of Coach Woodson's uh, thing, and that's when I mentioned too about. You can have two types of NIL. You can have the person who loves the NIL and then it's just going to go, you know, smack you in the face because he wants to win, or the guy that's going to be affected by the NIL and just play because he's getting NIL. Those there's two dangerous things, and that's again not towards anyone at IU necessarily, but um, your your best players have to be your hardest workers and your best leaders, and yep. sometimes you can control that as a coach, and sometimes you're just a victim. You know, I uh, yeah, I've had teams where we had good talent, but it fell apart because the leadership wasn't there. And they're all great kids that I'd have over the house right now. But as a as a leader in a program, we graduated those the year before um, that were very very special leaders. And and, and you know, we held retreats and we tried to do all that mental coaching and all that stuff. But sometimes it just it is it just happens. And I think that is a recipe too that you see in these teams that are still playing right now in the women's team in 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 the NIT and the NCAA um you know yeah people are going to get paid different amount of money they're going to get different amount of playing times but we mentioned it all year Jared connected this team was yeah. not connected until the very very end uh and 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 that's on the players and that may you know the coaches somewhat uh are responsible for that but the the players have to have that basketball IQ that competitive nature uh as well and i think I tell people now, you want to go into coaching, go into psychology. It's not about X's and O's. You can get a, a, a video and find good plays and figure out how to call plays and go talk to people and do that. But how do you manage um, your squad? How do you build relationships with your players? How do you get players to then carry that over to their fellow players? Um, yeah. That's why I said Shaka Smart with the energy generating behaviors and some of those things. Those things I get laughed at as a teacher sometimes because it's, it's not the pedagogy of – calculus or whatever else but uh that's why you know <laughs> yeah but um, that's the stuff that matters I, we we have great success in tons vegas that's my class they've named my room tons vegas what goes on there stays there <laughs> um but in any any job it's it's relationships and and, yeah. and it's accountability and those combinations a coach can deal with but you got to recruit that um you know well, and i'm sure you, you, you have to recruit it or you have to develop it trace jackson yeah, davis didn't show up as a develop. leader but it, it is, but that, that's where you need, that's where I think you need a foundation of, it can't just be all portal. I think you have right. to recruit the portal, but also focus on high school recruits. And, and this is where I think to me, you know, with your high school recruits, you, you definitely have to recruit for talent. I mean, there's gotta be a baseline of talent. I think if I were making priorities, I would really want to focus on, okay, is this guy a leader? Because if he's going to be here for three or four years, you know, by his third or fourth year, he's got to lead this program. Because we may go to the yep. portal and recruit for talent and fill a spot. You know, we need a shooter. Let's get a shooter. But the guys who are here are the ones who are going to have to lead. And so, you know, I don't think Trace showed up as a leader. I think by the time he left, he was an incredible leader. You know, and we probably underrated how much, you know, losing him, not just the production, but also just the leadership was going to hurt. And same with Miller and Race. I mean, I think all those guys, you know, led in their own ways. So I think that might be a little bit of a difference in recruiting priorities now is with your three or four year guys, maybe a little bit more of a focus on Correct. leadership. And then the portal is where you go get your talent or go get, yep. you know, pl- plug and play talent. And you have some veteran guys coming back for Indiana. So if there's something to be yes. positive about, you, you have Leo and you have Galloway. And, and sometimes when you're at your back end, the leadership grows immensely too. You know, when it's your last year or last couple of years, uh, you know, you can grow into that leadership. And you have Renew in his third year. So we it's not a totally yeah. empty cupboard. I mean, Utah State got to the tournament and totally had 10 new players. But that is so, so absolutely rare um, yeah. that that happens. But I do think um, – I do think that the 
one of the positives going into next year is you got some leadership guys back uh, that you know uh and 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 renew who's been through it for three years so when you bring people in it's not a total uh total uh you know rebuild in that leadership category but they have to step up and be be the leader too um you know x was basketball wise i think was the reason you know his injuries were the reason there were struggles this year i i honestly firmly believe that after you know going back over the season um but x as a leader probably needed some work uh, to be fairly honest with you on that and he was the point guard and so you know that that you know there were some other issues that i will not share on here but that there just was some problems getting that team to that level of connectivity this year uh, yeah. for a variety of issues that wasn't there the year before yeah and i think you know you bring up an interesting point about the guys coming back you know a guy like leal his leadership is important you know, he is a guy who he's a, a huge piece of your culture. But as we all know, you know, leadership has to come from your best players, too. This was part of the problem last year. You know, Khalil Ware was the best player. He's a sophomore trying to find himself. You can't really expect him to same with Renew a program like IU. I think Renew was in the same boat. You know, I remember hearing a lot in the offseason about, you know, just in the workouts and stuff, you know, how Renew was kind of emerging as a leader in terms of, you know, he knew where where people were supposed to be. He has a high basketball IQ. I know sometimes people chuckle when you say that because he's making some of these silly mistakes with fouls and learning how to pass out of the post. It doesn't mean he doesn't have things to work on, but he does have some natural leadership abilities that I think as he now moves, you know, into his upperclassman days and is clearly the go-to guy and just has a perspective weathered by so many up and down moments, I think he's going to be able to provide some of that leadership that you started to see from a guy like Trace as he got older. Not trying to compare those guys directly, but you know, I think Trace's senior season was so awesome. It sometimes is easy to forget the winding road we went with him through three years. You know, wanting more and wanting that leadership, and he eventually gave it. And I think Malik is on that track. Maybe it's not totally ready next year, but I do think for whatever the vision is for next year's roster um, to, to, to come together and be better, I think you've, you're going to have to have great leadership from Renew. You know, you need it from Galloway, you need it from Leal, but you have to have it from your go-to guys. And Baco, he'll be a sophomore. Is he ready for that? I have no idea. And maybe you can bring in some of that, you know, from, from the portal. But I think that's where Renew, I think that's where him coming back is so important. You know, and if Indiana did indeed have to overpay for him in NIL, great. I have no problem with overpaying your own guys. I think those are the guys who should get more of the NIL money, frankly. Um, so I think he's just such an important piece because he's going to be the go-to guy, and I think he's got to be the leader. And I think as a junior, he may be much more ready for that role than he was this year, and that may help some of the other pieces fall into place. So hopefully. I mean, it's you know, it's all theoretical, but I, I do think as we reflect on the season – you know, and why it didn't go well. There's so many reasons, and we could sit here and list them all out. But, you know, the the lack of internal leadership, and then I think the lack of trust and continuity that trickles down from that. Because if there's no leader, then people kind of take turns doing it, and it just it doesn't work <laughs> that well that way. You know, you need a hierarchy on a team like that. Um, and Indiana didn't have it. And so hopefully that's one of the things, you know, and again, the coach... <clears throat> as you said, sometimes coaches are kind of at the mercy of the leadership abilities of their team, but a coach also has to cultivate it and create True. a situation where guys can step up and, and do some of those things. And so, you know, I really hope that's the case because I think Malik, I think he has the potential to be that guy. I really do. Um, and it's, it's a lot to put on him while also having to produce and do all those things. But that's, you know, that's what the big NIL checks are for. That's what's expected of you as an upperclassman at a program like Indiana. And that's how you become a guy like Trace Jackson Davis, who, you know, I mean, really achieved legendary status with what he did, you know, as a senior. So, you know, again, I mean, we kind of got off track talking about this, but I, I do think it, it really is germane to this conversation because you can't just go out and it's not just an accumulation of talent. It's such a great point you made. It's got to fit. This is basketball. And so that's where I'm, I'm just going to be so interested to see. And that's where, you know, I think that's where I think a guy like Tony Perkins can be underrated a little bit 
because he's a guy who's going to come in, has been through the wars. He's a guy who could step in as a, a fifth year guy coming in from outside and provide leadership because he's been there. He's done it in the Big Ten, you know, and, and you know, so you're still going to need some internal guys. But that's where maybe you look at a guy like that. and It's like, boy, he doesn't have quite the talent that, that we needed. But does he give you the leadership? Does he give you some of the intangibles that you didn't have? Because that stuff matters too. And so that's where a lot of this stuff, it's not just, you can't just look at a Ken Palm page and decide if the guy is the right fit. You know, you have to wait and see all the pieces and, and, and understand the guys at a little bit of a deeper level to really start assessing that. And I think that's part of why I want to have a little bit more humility this off season and how we discuss the guys who come in, because we can look at highlights and we can look at efficiency numbers and we can look at stats but it's not enough. You know, you really have to reserve judgment until you start to see it all coalesce because you, cause it may start to come together and you're like, okay, now I see the vision. All right. I didn't understand why you wanted a guy like that, but man, he really makes it all, you know, all go together. Um, and so I just, I think it's an important mindset for us all to have as we go into, into this portal season. It, it, and it's just, it's just healthy too, because every time you see someone, the tendency for me is, oh, Indiana contacted this guy. Then you want to go look up video and you want to look up things. Well, Indiana's contacted and, and probably uh, has at least been watching, I'll say that, uh, players all year long. If you're doing your job, you're creating a list at the least of players that you think might end a portal so that when it, they do hit, you, you're already ready to roll or, or whatever you have to do. I, I know the college game is such a wide open thing. That, you know, I heard stories last night uh, over in Indiana State about – you know, uh, people, you know, coming after their players uh, during the season. And, and, you know, I know the managers and the Dobos and all of that. So you hear some stories about that and you just know it's going on uh, all the way across. I don't like that. I'm, I'm all for the transfer portal uh, with some modifications and I'm all for NIL and all that. But now it's taken another step of whatever the official word is, tampering or whatever. But it's there's no rules because the NCAA is toothless to do that. But um you know, it's a, it, it's a free season of recruiting 365 days a, a year, too, with this portal. Um, yep. So, you know, when you, when you see Indiana's contact to someone, well, maybe some other school has contacted them two months ago when they shouldn't have. You know, other, other, other schools have already promised. You know, you, you wonder, too, you got teams in the NCAA tournament, and a guy declares last Sunday, and two days later he's going to Gonzaga or wherever already. And, you know, That's all back-channel it stuff. It's all back yeah. channeling, and there's so much, so many, much of that back channel stuff that there's no way we can even provide that for you uh, information because obviously they keep that stuff quiet. But you know that works against uh, schools too. If if you know you we hear as fans about this guy entering the portal, well we don't know. Eight schools have contacted him in December, you <laughs> yeah. know uh, already in back channel stuff. That that's crazy away the college bath. And I'm resigned to not get caught up in. And all of that, but when the jerseys come on in November again, I'm going to say it's college basketball and put my blinders on and enjoy yep. the game of college basketball, not how the rosters were built at this school or that school or who I heard was, you know, uh, back channeling our players at Indiana or Indiana State. I'm, I'm going to put that away because I love the game so much. Um, yeah. and I know people, people wonder why I wear a Milwaukee sweatshirt and all that. I just love college athletics and college sports, always loyal, number one to IU, but I'm different than a lot of people in that I, I, I can cheer for Indiana state where my son went and I can, I can root for a Marquette and I just love good college athletics. And I still think that's around Jared, uh, despite the, the high dollar values and, you know, buying players and buying teams, that, that stuff just makes me feel uncomfortable. I'm not against it. It's just, it's not what I have been used to but, but that's just thing, part coach. of the game but 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 you brought this up earlier you know as long as there are trey galloways and mckenzie holmes and tyler colix and jamal sheds and these people that would play the same way whether they're getting one dollar or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars those are the guys that connect you to the sports and the atmospheres and all that stuff and that's as long as college sports has that college sports will be okay um, all right, yeah. we're running late. We have some mailbag questions to get to. The last thing, and again, we will continue to talk about this. There's a lot more to cover on all this stuff, and we have the whole offseason. Um, I know people are probably wondering why we haven't talked about Bryson Tucker yet. So Bryson Tucker, if you haven't been keeping up on this, and you know, credit to uh, Jeff Rob Johns at Peaks, Alex at Inside the Hall, you know, everybody who's been reporting on this, uh, Chili Donovan and his Discord. Um, Bryson Tucker is a... Is a 
either a high four star or five star player. He's ranked like around the twenties. Um, he played at IMG for a little while. He was going to go, it was assumed to the ignite program, uh, the, the G league team, but they've disbanded that. And so his recruitment kind of got opened up. Now, this is a guy who's being recruited by everybody, you know, had offers from Kansas and Michigan state and all these different places. Um, he took a visit to Indiana. There have been several different reports by the people that I just named that Indiana is in a really good position with him. Um, that's all I know about that. You know, we'll talk about that at, at a later date if he does end up committing. Again, I think we're just shifting our priorities a little bit this offseason to not get as caught up in that stuff. And I'm kind of – let me just throw this out there, Coach, and we'll talk about it privately too, you know, because I know someone mentioned this like, hey, when are we going to get a commitment so you can do the emergency podcast? I do enjoy doing the emergency podcast, you know, and it's <laughs> – people kind of expect it from us when there's a commitment. There's a part of me that kind of doesn't want to do those anymore. Um, not that they're not fun. And I do think you can get some interesting discussion of, you know, a guy's scouting report and that kind of thing. But, you know, I think back to the emergency podcast about Liam McNeely. It's like, okay, the guy never played for us. And, you know, maybe we'll still do them. Maybe we won't. You know, maybe this is just me early in the off season. But there's a part of me that just kind of wants to focus a little bit less on these guys that have never played for Indiana before. Um, and I know we, we still have to analyze it in a certain way. Um, so I don't know. That's just a thought that's running through my mind, whether that's actually the right way to approach it or not. Um, feel free to give us your feedback. I know it's fun and maybe I'm making too big a deal and being over serious about it. Um, but I just, I, I don't know. There's just, there's something about this season, you know, and how caught up we got in all the individual players. And then you actually get to the season. It's like, oh, this doesn't fit at all. <laughs> You know, so why do we spend so much time talking about it in the off season? So anyway, that's, that's just where my mind's at. And we'll, we'll kind of figure out what to do when there's an actual commitment. Um, anyway, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that before we get to the middle. No, I, I think, you know, you want to be excited when you get new players. Um, but you, you're probably a lot where I'm at uh, when you're getting six new players every year, that's an adjustment for a lot of fans. Um, yeah. And then we all, I mean, a lot of people get excited again, just mentioning Indiana's connected with this person. Uh, I am getting to be uh, maybe a little more sensible. I doubt that I'll ever get there. Um, but at least, you know, we really need to wait until November and that ball tips off to see what, what's going to happen. Um, yeah. you know, because everyone's going to have a highlight tape. Everyone's going to have statistics. Everyone's going to have their thoughts and yet we still need to talk about it too. You know? Um, so maybe, maybe an emergency podcast or a review on a, on a regular sheet uh, on a regular uh, run sheet for a, a week show or something yeah, like certainly that, a scouting but report kind of Tony, sure. we, we need to be a little more, all of us need to be a little more cautious with, is that production always going to immediately be what we think it's going to be uh, because of the fit and the style and all of, all of that kind of stuff um, need some time to, to, to really see it before, you know, a kid who scores 18 points, you know, uh, at a smaller school, and then you come and you got Mbako and you got Renew who are going to get a lot of shots. Can that young man fit into the system? Yeah. That's something that we all really don't know because he's not going to get those same volume, you know, type of shots. So, uh, yeah, to back off the 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 kind of overjoyous, you know, enthusiasm, I guess, <laughs> um, if that means not doing them, I'm, I'm kind of for it. Or we still can do them, but at least just say, here's what they did here. Here's the yeah. likely fit. Um, you know, they're, they're going to have to work on this or that and give our, give, give us some thoughts. We, we could do that. But, um, yeah. It's easy to say now, if Malik Mack commits in five days, you know, maybe, maybe sound on the alarm. But, you know, yeah, yeah it's just – I like the excitement, you know, to Lisa's point in the chat, it's fun to get excited. You know, it, it really is. And I think maybe that's part of it is, you know, and, and everything is framed by the season that you just had. And maybe that's part of it. It's a little bit harder, I think, to have the genuine excitement for just the commitment, because now we got another very valuable reminder about how much fit matters and how we really don't right. have any idea what these guys are going to do until they get there. So a scouting report on what the guy is like, for 10, 15 minutes, great. But spending 45 minutes to an hour trying to talk about it, you know, I just don't want to yeah. waste everybody's time. So anyway, no decisions have been made, but I just wanted to share where our head's at. Um, okay, do you have time for a few mailbag questions? I sure do. Okay, let's go with this first one, which was addressed directly to you uh, from Jared. 
not me, but another Jared. There's a question for Coach. Which former Indiana high school prospect that is now in the portal would he like to see become a Hoosier? You only get one. Um, and I know we were having a discussion in uh, our Substack chat earlier today about Connor Hickman, uh, who played at Bradley and was at Bloomington South with Anthony Leal, um, played under J.R. Holmes. And so a lot of people have been talking about him. He's a you know, a, a two guard type, really good shooter, you know, can put it on the deck a little bit. Tony Adrania did a nice uh, highlight video of him and, and did one for IU Film Room. Um, so obviously he's, you know, one of those guys. Tony Perkins is another guy who played uh, for Indiana high schools. Um, from your perspective. A siege uh, all- siege from Wisconsin is another Indiana Wisconsin. guy that I'm aware of. Um, yes. To me, to me, again, and I'm not getting wrapped up in this Jared who asked the question um, too much, so I haven't really given it a whole lot of thought. But Tony Perkins is the one who's played at Iowa. Um, he's from uh, Indianapolis area. That is just a gritty type of guy that I would like. I Brian Tonsoni would like to see. Again, I am going to defer to Coach Woodson, and, and and be glad that Coach Woodson gets the guys that he feels comfortable with within. So um, I think that's where where I'm at. You know. Uh, I am intrigued by kids who maybe didn't get to come to Indiana and then went somewhere else and have played and want to come back home because I think there's a little bit of that competitiveness that I talked about. That they want to come back to the home state. Um, the Blackman kid from Stetson, again, I don't yeah. know what he's like defensively if he fits Coach Woodson's defensive mindset, but he can sure fill it up. And we've seen what a Blackman can do wearing the cream and crimson. Uh, so that could be exciting um, a, a little bit if you're just looking for a shooter. But again, this is where you got to trust the staff and Coach Woodson. Wherever you're at in their belief of, of, of whether you like Coach Woodson or not, you got to trust them to figure out what's what, what's best uh, because they're doing a hell of a lot more work than Jared and I are to prepare for the show to know the strengths and the weaknesses of these of these young guys. I don't think being an Indiana guy is a prerequisite for bringing someone in, a high school guy. Um, it might help if you do bring that guy in if you're if you want to start building a little more recruiting momentum in the state of Indiana uh, and get those freshmen in before they transfer. Um, but I am intrigued by that because I do think that uh, those kids would want to show out for their home state, uh, and I still think that holds value um, in here in the state of Indiana. So I wouldn't be against um, any of them, but I think Perkins is the closest fit to the type of uh, player that Coach Woodson might want as far as defensive pressure and toughness at the rim and, and, and that ability. Uh, the it, Both Asijan and Blackman can shoot, but Asijan lost minutes at Wisconsin for a transfer at the big big time level so you wonder um you know i i I would love all of those guys but leland walker the other one um from indianapolis too uh, is more of a point guard too that uh, again might might fit all right let me ask you this i didn't ask this question during the uh the portal discussion um, but you just made me think of it you know there's kind of two different ways you could look at this you can look at and say okay we have to raise the floor Right. So if we get a chance with Perkins, we got to take him because if we miss him, you know, we could end up with something less. If we can get a guy like Hickman from Bradley, you know, and these aren't going to be guys that are really high up on the list, but they're solid players that fit needs. Right. Or you can say we're going big game hunting, baby, and we're going to get, you know, we're going to go after one of those top 20 players. And if we don't get them, then, you know, we'll drop down and, and we'll just have to get who we get. Do you think you know, given where the program is, you know, and kind of understanding how important this season is for Mike Woodson and the trajectory of the program, would you be more focused on raising the floor or trying to raise the ceiling for next year? Because I do think that can start to color your priorities, you know, in terms of how you're going to attack the portal and at what point you're going to take a commitment from a guy. Yeah, that's a great question. It probably needs some time to really think about it. But my initial answer is raise the floor and get some guys in that might be two or three year guys. So can you do both of that? Raise the floor and start building whatever you can program wise now in the portal era. Uh, you know, I said it's not a program building thing; it's more of a team by team building thing. But I still believe that that combination of two or three year guys. Can you get a sophomore that's coming in that'll give you two or year, two years? Yeah. Can you get a freshman guy in that fits your? St- and if that just raises the floor a little bit, and we make the tournament, and now that's three out of four years. But now you got those guys coming back. And now you can add two or three more portal guys instead of six and seven every year uh, and, and having a brand new team every year. I think yeah. that would be 
um, obviously, I don't want to shut down expectations of being a top two or three team in the Big Ten, a top two, or, uh, you know, a top four seed in the NCAA tournament. That's Indiana basketball, and just getting to the tournament is not necessarily acceptable. But it might be uh, given what happened this do. year. Yeah, when there's a lot of work to do. You're kind of in another two or three year window where let's just get to the tournament and have a chance to compete. And, and I'm reminded every year, and I'll, I'll share that uh, with people. Um, you know, it's hard to win and it's hard to get to the sweet 16. And, and it gave me some, and watching these tournaments and going to the horizon final and watching, you know, the 15 seed, the team's going to win is going to be a 15 or a 14 seed and how tough they play and physical they play that, you know, last year getting a four seed and getting beat by Miami is not as awful as a lot of us might think it, it, it was, um, you know, and, and in a down year winning 19 games, um, there's some bigger issue pictures and I've more than addressed those. Um, uh, but it's hard. It, it, it is really, you saw a really great Indiana state team, not make the tournament. Um, so it's highly competitive world out there and we just need to get back to a consistent, make the tournament before we jump up to that elite eight and final four. And, and you wish that this year would have been one of those stepping stones, but it wasn't. So let's yeah. raise that floor back and then keep building instead of taking coin flips on talent every year um, and, and maybe yeah. hitting one year and then you flip a coin and replace six people the next year and you go back down. I, I don't know that a lot of us want to be that springboard up and down. There needs to be some level. That's what Tom that looks Green like in fired. the portal era. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we fired Tom Crean because of that. No, I, I'm with you. It's a hard question to answer because on the one hand, you say floor, and I even made this joke in Discord. It's like, Indiana basketball in 2024, you know, just trying to raise the floor, you know, that it really, it's it's weird to be in a position where you're saying that. It's like, no, we should be competing for banners and championships. This is what Mike Woodson said. This is the expectation. And I agree, that's always the ultimate expectation. But, you know, you do run the risk of, and even if you succeed with raising the ceiling for next year, if you're then, if it, if you then have to start over and drop all the way back down and play, you know, try and play that same game again next year, are you just on this constant roller coaster? So I'm with you. I think, and look, this is one of my concerns with bringing Mike Woodson back. And we're not going to know how this plays out until we see it. You know, when you have a coach that feels a lot of pressure to win now, they're making decisions for next season. Are they also building the foundation for the future? You know, we're going to have to see how it plays out. Right now, we don't know. That's what I would like to see. You know, and so if that means that maybe you take a, a kid who's the 40th best transfer prospect right now because he's going to say that, even though you might have an outside shot at 15th, but that guy's going to be around a couple years, I'm with you. I would prioritize getting some of those younger transfers that can help you with continuity, even if they're maybe not the top flight super talents, because you want to build something sustainable here. Not just be on this, and, and you know, ridiculous. To be fair, I don't know if it is in college basketball. You know, uh, a lot of talk about Dusty May and listening to his uh, interview. He wants to do that. He wants people in. He's saying all the right things about you know playing for the front of the uniform and all that. Is that possible uh, in in this era with people moving in and out? It, are or is the new thing going to be that flip a coin every year? Can you put the best team together? You know, obviously, I think the other way, but. I'm not in that business. Um, and, and the one thing that's nice is you do have the ability to get new players every year and move people out that you didn't eight, nine, ten years ago. So it's a it's a better position as far as being able to rebuild quickly. Um, but that roller coaster is something that I, I would sure like to to avoid if, if at all possible. If it can be done across college basketball, we'll see if the Dusty May idea at Michigan uh, is going to be uh, available uh, to do that. How long these coaches have, you know, in, in order to to build that consecutive, you know, streak, or is that something that's just by the wayside? I think that's a good fit, Dusty at Michigan. I think he was really smart to go to Michigan instead of Louisville. I Absolutely. Think. I think it, I think it, I, for him, I think in a vacuum, yes, you could say Louisville's a better job. I think for the way Dusty wants to coach and build a program, he's much more of a John Beeline type where he wants to develop fundamentals, yeah. have guys who are going to be there, maybe take guys who were under recruited and build them up. I think that was so smart of him to go there. And it's going to be weird. I think that's Man, why shirts turned down. Uh, was he, it was him and uh, the guy who took it. I forget his name right now from Kelsey, Charleston. Pack. Kelsey. Kelsey, it was one and two, uh, what I heard. And I think shirts turn, you know, has turned that down. Um, same thing. I think that's, that's real tough. Um, you know, 
uh, down there at yeah. Louisville. Um, okay. I we'll, think Kelsey we'll will do a good job, though. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. He, I mean, he's won at both the places he's been. Yep. Um, Ken Yoder, what is your expectation for getting a recruit committed? I know a lot of people are starting to get antsy. There's seven open spots. He says even one commitment to break the ice would be somewhat reassuring. Um, you know, again, it sounds like there's some good news on this Bryson Tucker maybe and some other guys. I, I have no idea if or when a commitment can happen. You know, I would just say I think we're still in the kind of early phase where I wouldn't panic yet. You know, there's still a lot of feeling each other out and trying to figure out who's going to come in the portal. There's still 16 teams playing that could have players entering the portal. So I'm with you that we need to start filling these roster spots at some point. I'm not going to get concerned about it. You know, if it drags on for another week or two, I probably will. But I think for now, let's be patient. Let's see what happens next week and see if we can get a few. But I think it's still a little bit early to be pressing the panic button. I mean, there's already a panic button on being seven guys. That button's been pressed, but I don't think we need to press the next panic button yet. The last thing you want to do is just grab people to fill spots because you feel pressure to fill spots. But at some point, you need seven or six and leave one open. So, yeah, I do think that, you know. But why why, why did they open the portal after the end of the regular season selection Sunday? Why don't they wait until after the Final Four? Is there some a, real, a, a valid reason for that? Um, I mean, I think it's – I think it's just being pragmatic about the reality of it. And the reality of it is, <clears throat> sorry, as soon as the season ends for teams, players are going to want to get in the portal. And so whether they're in the portal officially or not, all the back channeling is going to be happening anyway. So why don't we just allow it? I, th I think that's why. I mean, it's either that or it's just an oversight. I think we can all agree in a perfect world, none of these discussions would happen until the tournament's over. But that's three weeks where all these players that are done playing are going to want to start figuring out their next move, and they're not just going to sit on their hands because there's a rule that they can't talk. The conversations are going to happen anyway. Well, so, they've already – yeah, even before they announced for the portal, that's what we said earlier. So. Yeah, so, I mean, it would be Lisa less said chaotic. It would be less chaotic on the surface, and more of the fan right. attention would be on the tournament, and maybe that's reason enough to do it. But I don't think it would really change a lot of the stuff that's happening Good on point. the back end, you know. So as annoying as it is, um, and, and, and to some extent, what you're saying is the portal should be open 365 days a year if if there's back channel and conversation going on. I understand why I'm being ridiculous yeah. with that comment there, but I mean you have to have windows for where players, you know, for when players can actually move. You know, right. I mean, who but, knows? At some point, we may have a trade deadline in college sports, which will just be insane. But that's a conversation for another day. Okay, real quick. John says, what is the best scenario for IU to get back to better than middling Big Ten stature, starting with the current transfer portal onward through the summer and into next season? My answer to this coach would be raise the floor for this roster, because I think there's going to be some opportunities to move up in the Big Ten. You know, Purdue is still going to be really good, but they're going to go through a transition without Zach Eady. Illinois is still going to be really good, but they're losing a lot of pieces. Um, Michigan State is still going to be really good, but they're losing Tyson Walker and some other pieces. So I think, you know, for an Indiana team that already has two of the 10 most talented players in the conference coming back, if Mbako comes back with Mbako and Renew, build a, a, a good solid roster around them and I think there's going to be more upward mobility available in the Big Ten this year because of the lack of proven, experienced, high-end talent. Did you just foreshadow Alex for his uh, Big Ten top 25 players <laughs> that he needs dude. to have Mbako and Renew? And <laughs> if you're after all the dude, arguments with people about Alex, Xavier Johnson versus <laughs> Kase Tominaga next offseason, I'm not saying a damn thing about the top 25 list this year. <laughs> My, I need to take a year off. <laughs> from that um okay and then all right so seth says is there a situation where woodson is able to recruit effectively and not be extended it feels like we're in a catch-22 you know i think we should just i mean it's a very interesting question about the future of the program i think i kind of think we need to table it like in public discussions to a certain extent because you know Woodson's the coach a lot's going to happen between now and next season and that's when those discussions will be had and so there's just there's so much that can and will happen between now and then that again it feels like 
bloviating about that for three or four minutes is kind of a waste of time because you can try to project it out. But the number one objective for everyone is let's have a better season this year. And so if the collateral damage of another season is people have to stick with a coach that they may not want, well, let's just kind of address that when it happens. Because if if Woodson does recruit effectively and we have a good season and maybe there's adjustments, opinions could change. So I don't even want to project out my own opinion a year from now. So I don't know. I, I guess I don't really have a good answer to that. I think the best answer is just to table it and let's just see what happens. Just, just in, in, in general, I think you, you have to, as any coach, before their last year of the contract, something has to be done. Very yeah. rarely does a coach get to coach in their last year without an extension. Um, and then usually if they're not going to extend a coach, they move on from that coach prior to their last year. So uh, a decision about Coach Woodson is either at the end of this year or at the end of next year, whether there will be an extension or moving in a different direction. That usually um, what, what would happen in this time frame naturally. And that's part of the reason why they're – there is some reason to give, you know, coach that fourth year uh, because you are coming to a point at the end of fourth year where it, whether it's DePaul or wherever else, if you're at that point, you're going to think about do we renew this person going into his fifth year or do we wait another year and then talk. But you, you, there will be either an extension or moving in a different direction in the next two years at some point. Um, yeah. That's just from a contractual thing that I've witnessed in, in college basketball. Yeah. I only know of a couple situations where a coach coached out his contract and then uh, the school went a different direction. I think it happened in Indiana State with Greg Lansing. Um, his his next to last year was a COVID year, um, and there wasn't money to buy him out, uh, and they just let him coach his last year and then didn't renew. But that is rare that that, that, that happens. Yeah, and I really – I have no desire – to come on here for the next nine, 10 months and have everything be a referendum on Woodson's job. Right. You know, to me, it's okay. Here we are. We now need to see 11 more months of results and then let's assess it again. doesn't mean we won't criticize things as they happen, you know, or laud things as they happen. But I just think now, and I think we learned some lessons about the timing of when those conversations should happen. I, you know, I think, um, I, just, I think it's good to just table that and and here he's the coach for this year and let's assess the moments as they come up and then at the end of the year you know kind of like we did this year you kind of take a look at the pros and cons list and you figure out okay what do you think is best now moving forward but we know what's going to be happening moving forward for the next 12 months and so you know let's take it all in be open-minded give it a full chance you know, I think there are going to be some minds that are very difficult to change. I think my mind is going to be very difficult to change, but I am committed to being open-minded to actually seeing what happens. And, you know, I hope, so just to give you an idea of what to expect, like this is not going to be a year of Woodson bashing, um, you know, or pointing out every little negative thing with a slant towards, see, we told you so, this shouldn't be happening this year. No, this is the coach. It's Mike freaking Woodson, you know, and so even despite, you know, some of the issues that have happened here, you know, over the last year that we liked or didn't like, whatever, it's still Mike Woodson as the coach of Indiana basketball. So let's see what happens with it. And then we'll assess it again because it's kind of a waste of breath to spend a whole lot of time talking about it between now and then. Uh, the last question from Rick, he says, I hear three million. I hear five million. Does anyone really know how much NIL funding IU has? Who decides who gets paid a certain amount? Um, I don't know what the number is, but from every source I have talked to who would know, it is essentially the idea. It, it's obviously not a blank check. I mean, there's some limit on what it would be. I don't think Indiana will get outbid for any player that they want. I think if Indiana wants a player, they will put the most competitive NIL offer. I think Mike Woodson has that support from the people who write those checks. And so if a player doesn't pick IU, it will be for reasons other than money. What that total number ends up being, I don't even know. And I don't even know if it is known. I think there's a commitment to help Mike Woodson build the best roster for next season. You know, and so whatever, the number isn't as relevant as just the relative position of where Indiana is. And I don't really think there's any school in a better NIL position for this offseason than Indiana, which is crazy to say for a team that had the results from last season. But that's also part of the reason why it's true, is there's a desperation to, you know, 
get this better now with this coach? Um, who decides who gets paid? I don't know all the inner workings of that. At a certain point, it's got to be a priority coming from the head coach. And then I have no idea how the accounting works from there, how specific numbers are, are come up with. Um, are the amounts per player known? They are not published you know, publicly. I know like Eric from Hoosier Hysterics has said on a number of occasions that they – you know, they're, they're never going to release that information. And I, I don't, you often don't see it um, released. Sometimes you do. Um, but sometimes, you know, things are said in back channels. It's like, oh, this guy got $650,000. There's no way to verify it. There's no way to know. There's no way to know if that's someone just, you know, trying to position, oh, we're going to make the biggest offers. So I would say anytime you see that number, especially if it's just being spread around in a Discord or somewhere else, just view it with some skepticism. I mean, it's probably directionally correct of like the general number that's there, but there's not like a place where you can go like a professional athlete salary and see what he's getting paid this year and next year and when his contract's up. I mean, and that's part of the problem. And I think that'll eventually change. Um, but right now it's all, you know, kind of done privately. Do they get paid a lump sum, monthly payments? No idea, and it's probably different based on the deals. These are all individual deals with individual you know, entities. And so those contracts can be written up in any way. There's no standard way that it's done. Do they actually have to do certain things before they get paid? I, I don't know that technically. Like originally it was supposed to be, you know, like when we, when we did the interview with Tamar, it was like, okay, we're gonna pay you X, but in exchange, you have to appear on you know twelve podcast episodes with us. I think that's kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit. I think it's just kind of money. I think it's basically pay for play now. Um, and maybe yeah. in those contracts, there's hey, you'll do an appearance or you'll you'll do these things. You see players doing it. I'm not sure what the official rule is, and I'm not sure if there's any enforcement of it at all. So there's no you know. en there's no enforcement. I think what you see is when you see people doing. Um, you know, shows or, or, or commercials or whatever, that's part of what they've d gone out and done on their own, or they've worked on yes. their own, or IU has gotten them some things too, especially for, uh, not the bigger money draws or whatever, but I think your top athletes are just getting now it's pay for play and which is a lot of coaches have said the NIL, they've come to understand the NIL name, image, likeness, you get paid for a commercial, you get paid to, to do, uh, you know, go to a, a car dealership or something like that was what it was intended to do. Now it is simply you come here, we'll pay you some money. That's what I'm hearing, uh, yeah. that it's uh, simple, just get some money to, to come play salary-like type stuff. And part of what we have to understand is not all of this money just appeared out of thin air when the NIL rules changed. A lot of this money was exchanging hands under the table anyway. You know, the thing that NIL did is it's like, you know, it, it – you know, NIL has basically broken the dam, right? But when NIL first came out, it was like there was a little hole in the dam. And it's like, okay, here's a little bit of water springing through here. And yes, if you'll, you know, be a paid podcast guest or you'll go do an appearance at a car dealership, you know, we can use your name, your image and likeness, and then we can pay you. Maybe we'll try and pay you a little bit above what your actual market value is because we want the team to win. Now the dam has broken and it's just yeah. all this money that was flowing under the table anyway, because college athletes have a market value, which is what we're learning. Now all that money can just basically be over the table. And I think it should be eye opening for a lot of fans what that market value is. Like people aren't paying, you know, however much Malik Renew is making. I mean, it's certainly in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, people aren't paying him that just out of the goodness of their heart. They're paying him because they think Malik Renew can help Indiana win basketball games, and that has monetary value. It has intrinsic value. It has extrinsic value, you know, for the people that are donating it. And that's why pairs of, so many players have been getting paid all along. And now it's just able to kind of come above the table, be more organized. And, and more money know, has come in because it's been above, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, and there's been money. money under the table, but now it's more money. Well, now there's actual fundraising. I mean, now you can get yeah. fans involved, too. You know, that's part of the difference. Which so, is going to dry up at some point. Uh, there's going to be the pendulum is yeah. going to level level out, um, so, Oh man, who I was believe, it? at some point, I think, right? Yeah, I, I think it was the new AD at Nebraska. Um, I'll have to find this. I think I tweeted it a couple of days ago. But he was basically saying, like, look – 
we all know as athletic directors that within the next couple of years, there's going to be a line item for paying players. It's coming. It's either going to be forced on us or the smart programs are going to start doing it on their own before to get ready for it. You know, and so that's going to be the difference is eventually it's not, not all the money is going to come from donors and fans. It's going to eventually come from the universities and then there will be contracts as employees. And, yes. And all these conversations will be different because once you have employment contracts now, okay, say this Bryson Tucker commits to Indiana, right? Well, maybe if he commits to you for one year, because he's thinking about the NBA or just wants to keep his options open, you pay him say a hundred thousand dollars. I'm just picking numbers out of thin air, but if he'll give you a two year commitment, then maybe you'll pay him $300,000 right? Because he's committing to you longer, the school commits to him. And now I think that's what will actually bring some stability back to rosters. But until we get there, we're just kind of in this interim phase. And by the way, if you want to stay up on this, there's a, a guy on Twitter, Mitt Winter, um, who he played college basketball, and he's a lawyer now, uh, does a great job of constantly tweeting out different resources on this stuff. And so most of what I just said is just stuff I've learned from reading stuff he has said. Um, but that does seem to be the direction, you know, in which this is going, whether it's three years, five years, 10 years. Um, there was a really interesting proposal someone put forth, you know, talking about how maybe the best way for this to go, you know, because it's, it's still, you know, a student athlete coming to a school. So maybe the school commitment should be on the academic side. Okay. You're getting a scholarship, you're getting, you know, this other grant and aid type stuff. And then at the conference level is where additional salaries are paid to the players. And that keeps the universities out of some of the just complications that that can provide. And their relationship was with the players back on the more, you know, academic and athletic side. And the conferences start to handle so much since the conferences are so focused on the money. Anyway, the problem, that, that is one the problem potential. is there's no teeth to any rule breaking. So if the money was under the table and then, you take it to another place. What's going to stop that pe that money from still being under the table? No, this going would back all be above the table, the table, right? That's what I'm saying. This would no, all be above the I, table. I know, but if you take it away, some of the access and the donors, they did that before. It was, you know, what I'm saying. Uh, well, oh, so you're saying if? Well, yeah, but at, but at, at a point where players are paid their market value, because you know some of that money, who knows where that money is going to come from? And I'm I'm. We're, I'm really starting to get out of my depth here on this. This is a conversation okay. for Galen and Zach and some of those guys. But, you know, some of that money still could be people donating to the athletic To the department. university, yes. <clears throat> right, but then it's, or, you know, to the conference. I don't know exactly how all those logistics would go. But, you know, either way, if players are getting at or close to their market value, then there's not going to be a whole lot of room for the black market money to come in because that money has already got to be in the system somewhere if they're making their market value. So anyway, I mean, these are, you know, all things that I think it's just so crazy fans. right now. I'm, I'm clamoring yeah. for some sort of stability yes. with college athletics. I am with you on that. A hundred percent. I think, I don't think we'll get there until we get to actual employment contracts and let's stop pretending that this is something that it's not, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I don't, it's taken so long to get there, but we all know where it's going. So let's just get there. And that seems to be the prevailing wisdom not just of people who observe this, but actual athletic directors saying it. So, you know, now that they're saying it, I think that's a sign that we're ready to move toward it. Coach, we've done two hours, you know, probably wise because we haven't been on here in a while. Uh, I think in, oh, so, okay. So the last thing. That so we, we don't say, have a run sheet. We don't have a run sheet and we go two hours, right? <laughs> just go. We just go. That's let dangerous. Know, right? if, if you like the more free flowing format, let me know. Cause maybe every now and then we can hop on and do it this way. Um, so I know I, I put in the description and some people may have seen that Ryan Phillips has a byline at sports illustrated. Now you can go there. He's got an article about the Los Angeles Lakers. That's right up there. There's been a whole lot of upheaval with the company that he's working for. I guess I didn't realize he actually can't talk about it yet, um, publicly. Um, and so I don't want to say any more about it cause I don't want to get him in trouble. Um, so he'll, he'll talk about all that. But if you go to sports illustrated, our boy, Ryan with a byline at si.com, which, you know, I, I know si, you know, sports illustrated doesn't have the reputation it once did coach, but I still think that's pretty cool. Sports illustrated still Absolutely. means something to me, no matter how much, <coughs> you know, no matter how much the people who have owned that brand have tried to just run it into the ground. 
it still means something. Um, so anyway, so whenever Ryan can share the full story of what all is going on, he will, um, as you know. Um, but anyway, that's why we didn't talk about it here because I didn't quite realize that there were things he couldn't say. So just wanted to just wanted to let you know about that. It was pretty cool to go on the website and <laughs> on the front page. Ryan was, Phillips, special to Ryan SI. Phillips. I was like, I know that. I know guy. that guy. <laughs> and it's not an AI. It's actual Ryan Phillips. Who's who's writing it? I think they've gotten enough show. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Two hours. Um, all right. Well, this was fun. I enjoyed it. Our ode to Crimson Cast. Oh, just a wide ranging um, discussion. If there are topics as we move forward this off season that you uh, want to talk about with us, let us know. The best place is just to shoot me an email or put it in the mailbag threads on our Substack chat. We also have the Discord going on, which is a great place to just connect with your fellow IU fans. Uh, you can learn more about all of that at assemblycall.com. At a minimum, sign up for the free email newsletter, but then we've got a lot of other goodies if you want to go deeper with us. Coach, any final thoughts before we close up shop for the evening? No, just good luck to the good luck to the women. Uh, again, just a fantastic run uh, that, that they've on. Just go shock the world and beat the heck out of South Carolina and, and keep advancing. And, and regardless of the result, congratulations on a, on a wonderful – Wonderful season and a wonderful few seasons in a row. And anyone going to be at Tinkle uh, next Tuesday? You know, I think I'm in section 107. Uh, come say hello. Always like to meet people there. It should be. Uh, it's going to be Utah and uh, Indiana State. And nice. um, I forget who's in the other bracket now. But uh, good, good basketball. Uh, I'll give you a break before the final four. Very nice. Um, yes. Good luck to the women's team. Can't wait to watch that game. Um, doing the work will be live. Andy, didn't he say he's going to be joining Kathy? Andy yeah. was down there. Um, yeah, so he'll Coach be Coach Marlowe's in Spain, I think. Is he? Yes, Coach Marlowe in Spain. Um, so Andy will be on there. Check out doing the work immediately following that game. Uh, our buddies, Mike and, uh, and Bob from X's and Joe's, recorded a new podcast last night. They are just waiting on somebody, the editor, to get it up. So that's me. Um, it's probably too late to do it tonight, but I'm going to plan to have that podcast up tomorrow. So a new episode of X's and Joe's coming as always check out our friends at Crimson cast, uh, Galen and Scott had a really nice conversation, um, a few days ago that you will want to check out. And other than that, go Indiana women, let's go shock the world. And, uh, we, let's see next Thursday's open. Yeah, because this is – so ne next Thursday we can be back on the regular schedule because it will be the Final Four, which will be Saturday, Monday. So unless something wild happens and we decide to do an episode between now and then, let's all go enjoy the rest of the NCAA tournament, men's and women's, and then we'll come back next Thursday and recap whatever recruiting news has been happening. Uh, for those of you in the Substack and Discord, we'll be talking about it between now and then, but we probably won't have another podcast until then. Um, so until then, we look forward to talking with you. As always, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Here I come, Mrs. Stan Sony. We can still use those. All right. And no music. I uh, I had started the music at the very beginning and I had this <laughs> I have it recorded if you want me to send it to Oh good. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I just uh, shut it off. I just shut it off actually. Um but No, perfect. Yeah, if you'll if you'll upload that, that'll be great. I don't even know yeah. if I I did this so late. I don't even know if Ari knows that we're that we're doing the episode. So do it on up. Wednesday. Yep. So I'll put it in yep. a folder. Um, okay. As soon as we're done here. Awesome. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm gonna be in Coach. Bloomington again this week, uh, Dale. If you're still there, I think I'm gonna be at the game Friday and Saturday, baseball games, nice. Friday and Saturday. Uh, if, if anyone uh, is interested, it, what's the baseball team's record right now? Uh, they're struggling. Um, really shocking. Their pitching has really uh, hit um, uh, some real tough times, and they've been giving up a lot of runs. They're like two or three games over five hundred right now. Mm. So, uh, well, yeah, they can uh, get it going. Yeah, it, they have Ooh. great offense and really struggling pitching right now. They have all three of their top starters have been hurt. I think is what um, really? I've been hearing. Yeah, Megan just so, showed up in the chat. She's probably uh -oh. like, "Get me the get me the tax stuff. It's coming. I'm I'm gathering it all. Gathering Man. it all, Megan. <laughs> a little a little late. <laughs> a 
A little late. Oh, All breakfast right. Sunday. Yep. I just saw that. I oh, just showed up. Um, well, sorry, just showed up in the chat, I meant. I didn't see yeah. you in the chat previously. I'm going to get myself in trouble. She was probably leaving comments the whole time. Yeah. <clears throat> I might be well, up you. for breakfast Sunday. Nice. So, a tradition unlike any town. other. Yep. Love, Pretty love awesome. Sunday breakfast. All righty. <clears throat> I just wasn't looking. I know. I get told that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't she still be in the office working? <laughs> I think she is in the office. I think she's probably watching us from the office. Y'all be careful because yeah, I got some questions about my son's taxes that I might have to. <laughs> I know it's late and and that's not fair, so I, I'll just try to guess. <laughs> He's young. <laughs> she is in the office. Yes, yeah, she is. Of course she is. Of course she is. All right, y'all. Coach, I will talk to you Alrighty. soon, man. Yep, good night. Bye, everybody.